I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, I think there was one um, addendum to the agenda, and I don't recall if that was with the consent agenda. Yeah, I think it is. It is okay. So it's so that is uh, with the consent agenda. Um, any other changes to the agenda? Okay, so without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. So the next thing is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on an issue that is otherwise not on our um, agenda. If you would say your name, where you're from, and uh, try to keep your comments brief. Thank you. Okay, Elizabeth Parker. I live at 8 Hillside Avenue, and I'm uh, a member of a four-person um, mobility co-op working group. And so we're looking at uh, various mobility options for Montpelier, including um, potentially bike share, um, uh, Pebble, which we're going to talk about this evening, and uh, car share, figuring out how car share might work, uh, looking at scooters again. And uh, hopefully we will be doing a um, mobility uh, questionnaire uh, over the winter, early spring. And uh, so we have, um, I'm going to introduce Hanif Nazarelli, who is a, um, a sustainability uh, develop, a sustainable development expert, and he's, his current moniker is ecological community health. Uh, and so he's fallen in love with the pebble, and we have brought a pebble to my pillar. So we're going to talk about that briefly. Um, hi, I've got a. You need to screw your Okay. Uh, I'm a Montpelier resident, um, downtown resident, um, and I've just been engaged as a citizen with uh, the working group to look at uh, a multimodal transportation system. I'll say a little bit about the Pebble. It was, um, it's an enclosed uh, electric assist pedal trike. I'm going to pull, I'm yep. gonna pull okay. this up. So we have a picture from Montpelier Drive Electric, Aldi Vanna. Sorry, here. Yeah, it's been, it was up here for the Drive Electric uh, a few weeks ago, a Drive Electric uh, event, and, and it was very popular with. With adults? Now, those are two fair-sized individuals. Very fair so size. this is a, a trike, but it's got a back seat that can accommodate a couple of kids or a teenager and a dog or a pet, um, and it's enclosed. So we, it was actually recommended by the V-Bikes consultant down in Brattleboro, um, who's you know, employed, uh, contracted by the Agency for Transportation. And we were tipped off, went down to South Deerfield, West, Western Massachusetts, where it's produced um, by a small startup business, it's family business. Um, it's like four years since the prototype, one or two years at market, and there's probably about 50 or 60 of these scattered around, a lot in the West Coast in the US. Um, but only a couple in Boston and none that I, we know of in Vermont. So we were really looking at this as uh, it was recommended by the v bikes consultants as something that would be appropriate for this, for our environment, for, for our town. Yeah, and, and I'm just going to say that it's um, considered a class two electric bike. So it doesn't go more than 20 miles an hour. Um, and so what we're thinking about doing is um, letting people, we have it for the month of October, we're going to be letting um, people try it out um, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday between the hours of 2 and 5. There will be half hour slots and some of some Saturdays we will also ha allow people to try it out. We're planning on doing it um, on the shared use path from Bailey over towards the junction. Uh, there will be a training and um, before people are let loose with it. Um, and we are going to um, ask that people are very careful because it is motorized of being um, aware of walkers as they use the and share the path. So um, we've talked to public safety. And if you guys have any questions, we would love to entertain them. And uh, one of the reasons we're here is to invite you to try the pebble. So feel free. We're going to, um, Sustainable Montpelier is going to host uh, a scheduling page. And that should be up tomorrow. So check there, sustainablemontpelier.org. Any questions? 
can you just remind me of the date? I caught it and then I lost it again. The date? Date of the, the testing. Oh, yeah. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 2 to 5 p.m., There'll be half-hour slots, and then we have, I think, three Saturdays, and so we're, we have it now tentatively until November 1st. Okay, so, so ongoing, Monday, yeah. Wednesday, Friday. Great. Yeah. We just thought it'd be fun for people to try it out as a different option, and we thought rather than try it out on the road, which got such feedback from the scooter, that we would try it out on the shared-use path. Any other thoughts? No. Okay. All right, so uh, moving on um, to the consent agenda. Actually, Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Have you have an item. Okay. Yes, quickly. Just, um, I was hoping to introduce our new assistant city manager, Cameron Niedermeyer, tonight. She started on Monday and has promptly gotten herself ill. Um, so she's not feeling well, so I told her best not to be here snuffling all over everyone. So perhaps at the next meeting, but she sends her regards and has been here and is already jumping right into some issues. But So in case you're wondering where she is, she's home where she should be. Okay. Great. But we're glad she's on board. Well, we look forward to meeting her, having her here. Okay, on to the consent agenda. Um, so, uh, is there a motion? I move the consent agenda. Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, the complete streets update. Uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, Gary Holloway with the Complete Streets uh, Committee. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is our uh, annual update of what the committee has been up to. Um, probably been a year and a half, I think, since I've been to council to talk about this. Um, I'll keep this brief. If there's anything in particular that you all would like for me to answer, um, please jump in. I was just going to spend just a couple minutes talking about uh, what we've been up to and what our group focuses on. Uh, a few years back, uh, the Transportation Committee kind of broke and um, we're the kind of the safety awareness education piece of the, tran uh, the uh, Transportation Committee. Uh, currently we have six members, we have three vacancies, uh, we're working at trying to fill those vacancies. Um, one of the areas that we work on is, uh, is safety, uh, both pedestrian and bicycle safety. Uh, one of the initiatives we've been uh, We've been working on over the last year and a half now is uh, a night safety initiative uh, by purchasing and handing out uh, reflective armbands uh, to pedestrians um, who are not well seen. Uh, we've done so through uh, town meeting day uh, as well as um, other fall opportunities when it starts to get dark like right about now. Uh, and we're getting ready to uh, purchase some bike lights to do the same to try to bring bikes um, a little bit more seen in the in the uh, community. Um, we've worked with the uh, Department of Public Works to identify areas of safety needs around the community, um, sidewalks, um, you know, areas that need to get plowed, uh, and just uh, Tom McCardle has been great in their, in their department. Corey Lyon has been terrific to work with in terms of um, helping to identify what they're working on, provide us updates. Um, we look forward to inviting Donna to our um, one of our next meetings so that we can get her up to speed with the conversations we've been having and hopefully uh, be able to continue that relationship and I'm sure we will be able to. Uh, we, um, we've done a lot of what we do is provide input to things that are going on around the city, either from um, initiatives that the city is working on or with other, um, other organizations. Um, for example, when the e-scooter program came out, you know, we provided some input around that program so that if it comes back in one shape or form, um, uh, we can at least make sure that some of the safety concerns are addressed. Um, we've, um, <clears throat> let's see, other partnerships we've, we've um, advised on the Barry Main scoping study. Uh, we were invited to participate in the um, hiring of the consultant for the downtown master plan. Um, we've collaborated with uh, the transportation committee on um, the ordinance update around biking, um, and I'm hopeful to kind of collaborate and have collective um, suggestions and recommendations around that for the November um, meeting. Um, we've supported initiatives of others uh, such as moving the pocket park over to the senior center um, and worked with Norwich students in designing a covered bike parking which hasn't come to fruition but nonetheless uh, that was a good good effort that if we decide to move forward we have some nice designs. Um, we've advocated uh, for the use of a request track um, a, uh, 
request tracker on the city website, and we're hopeful that we can get that to be a little bit more prominent on the city website. Um, I think we were waiting for some of the uh, updates to the website to happen before we made that more visual. And what that is is a tool that um, the community can use um, if they see a trip hazard, if they see a pothole, um, they, can take a, they can take a picture, they can um, go on, they can upload that picture and some comments, and that goes directly to Public Works, and so they can be a little bit more responsive um, to some of those immediate needs in the community. Um, we've, um, we've recently had discussions around rules of the road education, uh, and. Onion River Outdoors, in partnership with Local Motion, uh, offered a free class to bicyclists, kind of aimed towards people who are new to cycling. Uh, so that's an opportunity to to, uh, uh, to provide further education. There's been a lot of concerns from from folks in the community that uh, bicyclists aren't following the rules of the road, and um, we're hoping to be able to possibly partner with Onion River um, Outdoors and Free Ride and others, maybe the police department. Uh, maybe it will provide a little bit of a stipend to um, the instructors who are offering this free class. Um, I'll just another quick minute. Um, we've, we have worked on a couple different events. Um, we're a small committee, so we, um, events can be pretty time consuming, so we don't organize a lot of them. But um, one of our committee members has been pretty passionate about this pedestrian scramble, which brings the community out. and looks at different areas around town that you otherwise wouldn't see, um, little hidden treasures around our neighborhoods, and it's been a fun way to get people out and see our community. Uh, we're working on a ribbon cutting event for the expansion of the, uh, the newly named Seba Winibi Path, uh, which will be Friday, November 8th at 315 uh, at Bar Hill, and we encourage uh, council and the rest of the city to come out and support that. Um, the tremendous efforts have been happening over the last several years on that uh, particular project. Um, in the future, we, we plan to do more education and classes around uh, bike safety, uh, as well as continuing the, uh, the, the successful armband, lighted armband and uh, bicycle light program. Uh, we're, we're hoping to be able to uh, help the city and Green Mountain Transit promote the, uh, the, new, the new transit center, which I showed up for the ribbon cutting and was told it'll be in two weeks, um, but <laughs> got a sneak peek of some of the apartments, which turned out really nice. Um, so excited to see that transit center uh, open up and that we can promote the, the use of that, those new routes that they have. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. I know you have a full agenda, um, but if council has any questions uh, in particular for the committee. Any questions? Don, I, I would like you to say that date again for the sure. shared use path. Okay. Yeah, and we're gonna we'll send some press around. It's Friday, November eighth, at three fifteen at uh, Bar Hill, and there's going to be an optional uh, bike ride and walk starting at two fifteen. Uh, we're collaborating with Cross Vermont Trail, and they're really excited about um, a future bridge uh, site at the other end of the trail. Uh, so they're uh, looking to ride out, ride bikes out to that future site, so they can talk a little bit about that. I'm ahead of the ribbon cutting. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. I just want to say it's a committee I, I visit once in a while, and it's full of positive energy, and you always have projects. So thank you, and thank your committee. Yeah. Yeah, so you're welcome. I was to say it, it sounds like you have been very busy and so grateful for all of the work of your committee. So yeah. if you could pass that on to them for us. That would be great. Um, Someday, I do hope that we are ever talking about reverse angle parking, and when that day comes, um, I imagine uh, the Complete Street Script will be very uh, key in terms of outreach and education. So, well, I'd like to thank. Uh, th I just like to thank uh, city staff and council and planning commission and other committee members who have supported, um, you know, a lot of initiatives that are really working towards Complete Streets and Montpelier. You know, I think that the various studies that um, have been in the past and you're working on now are really helping contribute to the kind of the long-term vision, even though we don't realize them all right now as we, you know, we all hit potholes sometimes, but, um, or, or shoulders are too narrow. Um, but I know that there's a plan in place that the city's working on to, um, to quickly rectify some of those immediate needs as well as addressing the long-term needs. So thanks for, for focusing those efforts there. Great, well thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. So on to discussing the Bethany Warming Shelter extension. Um, so I know there's a few folks here for that. Um, I'm wondering, Ken, do you want to come and address the council on this, or should I be directing this to someone else? Um, 
or to Bill. Do you want to do you want to well, start? I go can, ahead. I can help tee it up while everyone decides which way they want to go. Yeah. Uh, I, I believe at the last meeting, the city council gave two homework assignments. One was for the city staff to see if we could identify up to ten thousand dollars, and we've given you a recommendation of where that might come from. And the other was to Good Samaritan to figure out when and if they could open and what their operating plan was. And I, I, I see them here, so I'm assuming they're prepared to talk about that half of it. And, um, and then I think there was a discussion of whether or not you all wanted to proceed with this. Great. Uh, so um, I know there are some folks here from Good Sam as well. Um, if you'd like to come address the council. Hi, everyone. Rob Farrell, Executive Director of Good Samaritan Haven. And we do indeed have our homework assignment here. <laughs> uh, I will send an electronic version to you tomorrow. I, uh, I first want to acknowledge uh, that we're fortunate to have four of our board members here that are also Montpelier residents. Uh, so I very much appreciate their presence as well. As you can see, this is a pretty nuts and bolts budget, folks. Uh, so I'll let you look at that and then talk about uh, a potential opening date. Last time. I was here, I, uh, I commented on recognizing the sense of urgency to get the shelter open and that there's homeless people out there and that the weather is getting cold. We also further identified that a very ambitious goal would be over the next couple of weeks trying to get this open. We are actively hiring folks right now. Uh, unfortunately, this is taking longer than we anticipated. And I think a more realistic date, folks, of, of us opening the shelter would be more towards November 1st. And I say that in the spirit of offering a concrete date as opposed to one that is a moving target until we can get fully staffed. Great. Any questions? Uh, Tom? And that's compared to the date that, was it November 15th? Yes, it was. It was your plan opening yes. date. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Jack. Is, is this budget uh, for starting November 1st? No, it isn't. It would be for the full month. So it, this would be significantly less, Jack. OK, thanks. J uh, Glenn. Uh, Glenn. Uh, hi. Thanks for coming. And uh, it sounds to me like you're, you're hiring now. You're trying to get people in earlier than that. So it could possibly happen earlier than November 1st, but it sounds like it's unlikely from your point of view, or at least Cor hard to promise. Correct. Okay. Um, Ashley and then Lauren. Uh, so I'm assuming then it would be fair to say that um, whenever the ex exact open date is, um, that would be the $17 per night times however many beds. Yep. Okay. And so it would be prorated from whatever day, g open day is forward. Correct. That was it. Okay. Anything else? So um, I'm sure there are um, thoughts from people in the community uh, about this as to um, I, I, would you like to offer anything, Ken, on behalf of the committee? Or if yeah, not, that's fine. We, have, we appreciate uh, you all moving. Um, would you mind just yeah. uh, so that people can hear you at home? Thank you. Um, yeah, no, we, we appreciate your hard work on this and, and all that you do for the community. And, and thank you for, for responding to the sense of urgency. We understand that we can't just move heaven and earth with a snap of the fingers. But we appreciate your good efforts. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yes. I, I just want to remind Rob, Rob would you, the Rick DeAngelis, um, would you point out the complementary services issue if we start early with the churches. I yes. think that's important. <clears throat> of course. So this, this represents many of the pieces that need to fall into place. So traditionally, when we've opened on November 15th, it's in uh, sync with the other churches opening up to offer shelter, warming shelters and food, as well as we're very fortunate to have another community partner in another way that would also open up at that date as well. On, on which date? The, the 15th. The 15th. Yep. And we certainly be, would I'm they sorry. be moving to the first as well? The, that would have to be discussions with them as well, Bill. Okay. Um, 
comments from the public and then uh, thoughts from the council as to how you'd like to proceed. But if uh, there's comments from the public, now is the time. Uh, Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Um, I was afraid that this is what would happen. Uh, the task force has not seen the budget uh, until I just looked at the reporter's copy. Um, I had mentioned earlier on that the council should consider hiring folks that have experience, have done this, and get the shelter open earlier. Um, that was rejected out of hand by Bill, I guess, um, without discussion of the council. Um, Actually, Mr. Whitaker, I'm going to go ahead and disagree with you there. I think that the council directed uh, our city manager, Mr. Frazier, uh, to see if he could find the funding, and I think that was rejected by the council. So I, I understand that you're using Bill because Bill spoke up about the reasons that we have a contract, but I want to be clear that the council indicated a, a clear willingness to proceed with Good Sam as well. Well, as you know, Good Sam uh, refuses to be transparent about the expenses that are currently being uh, expended of state and public money, and that's a problem. The I've reviewed the uh, agreement between Bethany, a draft agreement between Bethany and Good Sam, and there are search provisions that run afoul of federal court decisions. Uh, without a warrant. Um, I want to be clear also there, Mr. Whitaker, the warrant requirement applies to agencies acting in their capacity as governments. And can so- Can you quit interrupting me? No, Mr. Whitaker, actually comment? I will not because I have frankly become incredibly frustrated with you and I consider you a friend, but, but the tone and tenor of your commentary and your but aggressive I have to be approach frustrated and silently behavior and so is unacceptable. You. Mr. Whitaker, I will allow you to finish when you can- You're not running the meeting, Mr. Whitaker, I'm the president of this council and I am speaking to you about an issue that has been ongoing with you for numerous months and I respect you and I consider you to be an invaluable asset to our community, but your tone and tenor and your profanity in emails, it's unacceptable, Mr. Whitaker. And if you want to talk about facts, you referred to yourself as a credible source the last time, Provide factual information to us, please. Not when I'm talked to with that level of disrespect to you. So in any case, uh, there is also a decision which I provided to the police chief today that the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that it's, this has to do with the failed effort to get the police to identify where people could camp in the interim. Um, being that the shelter is not yet open, that court ruled that camping on public property was allowed, anywhere on public property, uh, and prohibiting or citing uh, or harassing people for camping on public property uh, amounted to an unconstitutional, cruel, and unusual punishment. So that decision has been sent to Bill, both Bill and Chief Fakos. And that should prevail now in the interim until this uh, shelter uh, gets opened. Um, the way the notice is phrased, in uh, it says for 10,000 up to, I think that, that should be modified to be uh, strictly on a cost basis. I think you should scrutinize the padding of the budget that's been presented only tonight um, and look at past history of whether those people actually, that amount of staff time was devoted to supervising these shelters. But if we can squeak six weeks or eight weeks um, out of that 10,000, including springtime, we should attempt to do that. You shouldn't just say, you know, name your price and we'll agree to it. Uh, that would not be responsible use of public money. but. The city, being that city money and city, attaching city oversight, should definitely uh, consider asking that that provision for random searches, uh, absent a warrant or a probable cause, uh, be removed from the MOU. So I, I want to weigh in here just oh, quickly. Oh, actually, I'm, so just in light of multiple interruptions, what I would like to do is uh, if there are, so what I would like to do is allow people to have two minutes and they can say all the incorrect things that they want in two minutes and then at the end of those two minutes, 
will correct them. But I'm going to be pretty clear about that. So, uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen, you have about one or so minutes left. Okay? And then at the end of that, then we'll address anything incorrect. Is that okay? Just, to, just for clarity and moving forward. Well, I, I think I've made my points that, in effect, uh, we need to make a better SAM, and they are resisting acknowledging that the services of 20 beds, 20 cots on a floor, uh, 10 people to a room in Barrie is inhumane. And until we reach that resolution that that is not sufficient, we will not begin uh, using the task force to its full potential to design a new framework. Thank you. Anything to add? Uh, the only thing I was going to add was that I meant to make this clear at the beginning that, um, and it, it's in line with the conversation that Councilmember Hill had with Mr. Whitaker, the city is not assuming any operational responsibility. We're, we're basically adding funding to the, the grant that the state gets, and uh, certainly at, at this point in time, we are not intervening between in any agreements between uh, Good Sam and Bethany Church or Good Sam and AHS or any other funding sources. We're not seeking to operate the shelter or manage or control it in any way uh, other than making sure that it's available to residents of the community. If, uh, if the task force over a longer period of time comes up with ideas that, that everyone's involved with, great, we'll look at it. But you know, we're trying to get a shelter open early and that's the way to do it. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. I'm Travis Hill. I'm uh, one of the homeless. I represent the homeless in Vermont and the public in general. First and foremost, Rob and the people at Good Sam have a lot on their plate, and um, they do what they can do, um, as do another way, which I would like to say saved my life. and. Um, all the resources that are in Montpelier in regards to my dynamic as far as who I am as a person and being homeless and having the issues that I have in my life, um, what they offer me, they gave to me and uh, everything they said they would do, they did. Now that may fluctuate between case by case. Sometimes it's different, sometimes it's, and that's the issue I have in regards to that. I just want to make that publicly known that um, there needs to be more thought into that. Um, but based on all that they do already, I know that they'll come up with something like that in the future as best they can. Um, but as far as uh, the topic at hand, uh, the money that was generated, 10000 I think it was, um, something about 10000 in four weeks. I don't know why. I, cost that much for four weeks. Um, that might be something you want to look into. Um, I volunteered to help open the, the shelter early. I've offered to work at the shelter. I've offered to work at another way again. I've offered to volunteer there also. I'm very respected on the streets and uh, I'm better in my life. And I just want to be that known in this forum that the city of Montpelier is doing what they can do with what they got and how they can. But it needs to be fine-tuned, as do everything. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I would also like to chime in, uh, and I do apologize, Mr. Whitaker, for interrupting you, but um, frankly, your tone has, has become quite aggressive lately, and I have struggled significantly even to get through emails um, because you uh, use profanity at times, which I respect your right to do so, but it certainly doesn't make uh, engaging and uh, frankly helping you any easier. Um, and uh, I, I do believe that the council owes a significant debt of gratitude to Mr. Whitaker. However, um, I, this has become a, a significant point of focus for me in my work, and we all live here together. Mr. Whitaker, you are my friend and I apologize for interrupting you. It was completely out of line on my behalf, but I expect the same in return from you because in this community, we are capable of doing the things that you have identified as things that we need to do and addressing, addressing the issues that you've identified, but your approach has, has really created uh, a, a significant divide, and, and that may be a, in the long term a good thing, but in the short term for getting those critical things done, I would really encourage um, a, 
a more collaborative approach and whatever uh, whatever your issues are or may be with myself or anyone else here in city government, what I can tell you is this. We are doing our best to address the issues that you raise through partnering with area organizations, relying on our volunteers to do this work, and we need all of that work to happen so that the council can make informed decisions. But what is really troubling to me is that we are subjecting our employee city manager who receives a, a significant bulk of your communications, frankly, to what I would define as um, a, a abusive. And um, I want you to hold us accountable. We need to be held accountable. I completely agree. But Mr. Whitaker, it, it is becoming increasingly difficult to uh, listen to you accuse every single person in a very incendiary way of, of things that you have not been able to provide factual support for and you're asking important questions and there is a, a way to ask those questions that we can all get the answers that we all want and need that's not name calling, finger pointing, um, and, and frankly getting the last word in that doesn't really add anything to our conversation and probably takes a lot more time away from it. And I also want to add that I have uh, worked with Good Sam in my years uh, here in Washington County and in my experience. Um, Certainly there are struggles and challenges present in any not-for-profit work, um, particularly when working with um, populations with significant and unmet needs. Um, but in my, in my dealings with Good Sam, in my you know, day job life, um, Good Sam has really gone um, to, to lengths that I was uh, not expecting to see in order to uh, address unmet housing needs, at least uh, where they are able to find some wiggle room. Uh, they, they have been more than willing to, uh, to use that room in ways that um, I believe benefit our community. Other comments? Uh, Jack. I think there are um, a, a lot of things that could be said. There are a lot of uh, things that Mr. Whitaker said that I take issue with and that I don't think correctly uh, represent either the uh, rights and obligations of the parties at uh, Good Samaritan Haven or um, the state of the law in uh, in Montpelier, but I think that uh, what's really more productive is to uh, recognize that Good Samaritan is, a, is the one entity that is in the position to provide uh, services in what uh, has correctly been identified as an immediate crisis. And so all the other issues that have been discussed that or that have been brought up uh, <clears throat> are are within the uh, the charge to the homelessness task force that the uh, council created, and uh, for the sake of create of addressing long term problems and creating long term solutions, we look to the task force to uh, to meet that uh, charge. But for what's before us today, we have a proposal. From uh, from Good Samaritan Haven, that they could uh, essentially provide homeless serv services at uh, at Bethany Church for three hundred forty dollars a night, and uh, likely commencing uh, November first. And so, I move that we. Uh, allocate out of uh, sources identified by the manager funding in that amount uh, to commence when uh, Good Samaritan is uh, is ready to uh, pr start providing those services um, at, at the rate stated for uh, whatever time they're available to do so up to uh, November 15th when the state funds uh, uh, kick in. So it, can I offer a friendly? I think it, it's well, not. Uh, a hang on. There's not a second yet. Is there oh, a second? Second. second. Okay. 
Ashley. Um, I'm wondering if uh, a, a more succinct, clear way to state the motion would be um, that uh, I would move that the city of Montpelier allocate uh, no more than ten thousand uh, dollars to Good Samaritan or I'm to, to the committee to the. I'm not sure who the who the funds get allocated to. Well, so um, I may make an, uh, get another suggestion, um, but, but allocate no yeah. more than ten thousand dollars to be used for the early uh, opening of the uh, Bethany shelter at a rate of seventeen dollars per night to be paid per from bed. per bed. Yes, seventeen dollars per night per bed. Um, to be paid when that shelter opens. So my thought here too is that we had asked the uh, task force to come up with some short-term uh, options for us and this is one of them. Uh, one possibility is that if we are going to uh, allot up to ten thousand uh, dollars, but either they can't use it, you know, if it's if it's not a whole month early, if it's only two weeks early, um, then what happens to the extra um, funding there? It's possible that they may um, come back and say, you know, we would like to use funds for uh, porta potties uh, outside, you know, something like that, um, and I so. One of my fears um, was that, you know, would this committee come back every week with a new request? Uh, because this sort of procedure is very unusual. Like, this is not normally how we deal with money. Um, and I get that it's an emergency, and so that, but there's also, there are a lot of emergencies, and there are a lot of nonprofits that could come to us and say, you know, our situation constitutes an emergency and you should give us funds right now as well. So what makes this different? And I would say, well, we formed a, a task force to address this issue specifically and ask them to come up with options for us. So one possibility is that we say uh, that we would like to give um, the homelessness task force uh, the discretion to allocate uh, $10,000 um, on whatever projects they see fit. And that could be the early opening of the uh, shelter, it could be porta potties, it could be other solutions that we haven't discussed tonight. Um, but in just in recognizing that this is not a normal procedure, like I, I don't want to go back uh, and say, um, here's another 3,000 and here's another, you know, whatever it is. Um, I would be willing to, I mean, I. If, I, if, if there needs to be a fourth, I would be willing to vote for this $10,000 as a, a one-time thing up until um, we are having a budget conversation. And so either it's in the budget uh, or really the way that we normally allocate money uh, to nonprofits through the budget is through the uh, Montpelier Community Fund. And if we want to be um, uh, you know, funding uh, Good Samaritan Haven at a higher rate than we have been, then that is something that we should be communicating with our community um, fund folks. So that's that's sort of where I see this going. And if not, you know, what's your pleasure? Um, I know Ashley had something, and then Jack. Um, but it doesn't matter if you see the order. Uh, Jack, uh, go ahead. Since you, yeah. I appreciate Ashley's rephrasing of the uh, <clears throat> of my motion, and I I think that's a it's the same. Motion, and it's a fine rephrasing for it. I, I don't agree with your proposal to just allocate the ten thousand dollars for them to do with what they think is most important. What I think is, the proposal is to address a crisis, and if to the extent that the crisis can be addressed by providing shelter earlier than it would otherwise be available, I would say uh, we do that and. Anything, any further uh, appropriation would come through either the Montpelier Fund or, uh, or the budgeting and appropriation process. So you agree that it's ten thousand now, and that anything further needs to go through the normal channels? N no, because I don't think it's going to be ten thousand. I think it's probably going to be half so, of that or so, oh, okay. depending on what is okay. uh, is used oh, up based saying, on yes. their budget. It would yeah. literally okay. be just an allocation for whatever up to the mm -hmm. $10,000 would be spent and it would go, I'm a, I, would, I would rather get that dollar amount directly from the committee than we can either 
give the committee the exact dollar amount in funds to pass on or the city can pay directly. But mm -hmm. I, I would not feel comfortable just sort of writing a $10,000 check and, and not because I don't trust the judgment of the folks who are in the room, um, but, but more because uh, I think that this to me is a, a significant unmet need and it's been a significant unmet need for Montpelier for a long while and I want to make sure that the city approaches this in a way that is a long-term solution, not just um, a, a sort of short-term panacea that's like feel good for the winter and then we kind of go back to the status quo and have the same sense of urgency again and you know a few thousand dollars when you're talking about you know getting people connected with folks to help them fill out applications for things or uh, that's that can be a meaningful amount of money so can I just jump in if that's the without objection rephrasing can I get you to fire it at so me? if I could help out here maybe it might be the simplest thing is if you just divide 10,000 by 340 it comes out to about 29 nights so up to 29 nights of shelter services between now and <laughs> November 15th. No, I, that, that's also, that's way more math than I <laughs> could do on well, the I use my handy dandy uh, oh, yes. phone calculator. Um, I, I'm also fine with that, but I basically just want to make clear that, that the, what, what I think Jack's original motion and my shorter version that I've already forgotten was, um, it's uh, it's basically like it won't we won't go over the ten thousand dollar amount and it will in essence be based on the twenty you know the maximum potential of twenty nine days but so the, that the, um, Jack, the the one question I have and Rob you I might have an answer to this is that uh, it amounts to seventeen dollars per bed night or three hundred forty dollars per night but I suspect that. Uh, if on some night you have uh, 18 people instead of 20 people, it, it costs you no less money. And even if you have 10 people instead of uh, 18, 20 people, it costs the same that's correct. To, to keep open. So that's why I'm thinking $340 a night is per, per each night you're open is, is the way to uh, right. look Assuming at it. maximum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Uh, Donna. Um, I think I'm going to be a, a bit of a mood changer because the very next thing on our agenda is our budget. And we have some really bad news next year. And when I look at all the places this $10,000 came from, I get a little nervous. And likewise, as much as we have the Montpelier Community Fund and I support it, the city is not a social service agency. And I like Bill's point. We're not here to operate it. We're here to help a crisis. And unfortunately, Ashley, it's not a long-term fix. It's a short-term fix. And so- well, That's what I said. I, I, yes, but I see this as a short-term fix. So I, I just, I hesitate just throwing $10,000 at it. You know, I'd like to look at it more sensibly as what you're telling us. If it's not gonna open until November 1, uh, if you think there's a true chance that you're gonna open a week before, then fine. Otherwise, I would allocate exactly what you think you can do, which is half of this sum. And not that it's extra. It's found money that had an allocation and between now and the end of the year could be spent. So anyway, that's, it's not that I don't want to address the problem. I just want to do it as most confinedly as possible because this is not a solution, people. That's all. Further discussion? Just, I am, I'm, I was going to say, just to be clear, the motion that I have down is still Jack's. Yes. So uh, that I apologize. I okay. was writing it out. Uh, that the city allocate and authorize expenditures up to but not exceeding $10,000 to Good Samaritan to operate the Bethany shelter up to and until November 14th because the state funding kicks in the 15th. Is that? That's correct. Yes. Why don't you just fire that over? To yes, I will do that. Okay. So it's clear what we're voting on. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Nay. I think that carried. Right? I think that carried. No one no one's abstaining. Anyone abstaining? Okay. All right. So the motion carries. Um, so thank you um, for your work and uh, everyone getting us these numbers. And uh, hopefully it's able to um, open at least somewhat early. So great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.
All right, so on to the item that Donna alluded to, our preliminary budget discussion. Um, and I know Todd is here to uh, talk about that. Todd Preventer, Finance Director, City of Montpelier. I will not have nearly the fireworks of the last session. <laughs> um, my ob uh, objective tonight is just to share information with you as I'm receiving it. So um, as you know, personnel costs are typically the biggest driving factor of our budget process. Consumes about 60% of the overall budget. This year, we've been hit with a incredibly high health insurance premium renewal of 25%. Um, that has consequences in a lot of different ways. One, to the current fiscal year, because our health insurance plan operates on a calendar year. During the budget process for the current fiscal year, we took used the rates that we knew to be in effect through December 31st and increased those rates by 10% for January to June 30. The 25% increase that will be effective January 1 will actually impact the current FY20 budget by $103,000. So that's an unbudgeted expense. In addition, going into FY21, it's a little over $300,000 impact in health insurance, plus we have mandatory, or well, the only contract that is currently in place for collective bargaining is the fire department. Um, the police and DPW are both up for negotiation, so we don't know the exact uh, increase of any rate, if any, um, and personnel plan employees and unclassified and individuals would be subject to council's discretion. Um, but if we use that 2% number, it's in excess of $100,000. So my point in the presentation this evening, or lack thereof, is just to say that we're already looking at in excess of $400,000 in obligatory increases for FY21, which would typically equal the entire budget increase of 4% that we would normally be targeting. Um, so that's before any additional spending, any new programming, any new employees, and the like. So I don't have a lot more to add to that at the moment other than we are soliciting quotes from competitive health insurance providers. Um, but our rates are being based on claims experience, so I, I suspect that they will price accordingly. Um, however, we have not received the quotes back yet, so uh, this is still early and I still need to go through and refine all the data with current census and expected census data because you know the number of people that we have on family plans versus single plans will change throughout the year, so there's always a little bit of tweaking. Um, so I don't want to say these are hard, hard numbers, but they're very scary numbers in terms of the budget process. So any questions? Yeah, Jack. Todd, is the 25% uh, the definite figure from this contract, or is this the, the estimate? Because where I work, we don't, usually don't get the actual figure until like a month before the end right. of the year. So just speaking past experience, there's typically been a initial rate, and then through our relationship with Hickok and Boardman, they will work on our behalf to uh, negotiate a further refined rate, typically maybe two or three percent lower than that initial. Um, my understanding in conversations with Hickok and Boardman this year has been that Blue Cross has been unwilling to even start a discussion on moving that rate. And a big part of the reason is that last year we paid approximately $1.2 million in premium and had $2.4 million in claims. So even though it's insurance, and you want it for a rainy day, they're still going to recoup their money. Um, so one way or another, you know, so that's really the, the strategy. And because we are an employer of greater than 100 employees, we're not eligible to participate in any of the Health Connect exchange programs within the state. So we fall within the an isolated group of unserved small pool employers um, that don't have a lot of options. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Connor. Could you just like briefly go over the process for how you develop the budget? Are department heads sent like instructions asking them to keep it within a certain range or is it 
whatever they want. They know there's a budget Congress at some point. Right. So my personal approach is to instruct department heads to ask for what they need, what they anticipate they need, and what they would really want to run their department. From there, we then cut it down as a group. Um, that way, everyone has a chance to present their argument to the rest of the department heads in terms of why this is needed or why it's more important than something else. Um, and I'd rather be in the position of collectively cutting the budget than having things go unbudgeted or, you know, I'm going to leave my budget flat for next year, but then a whole bunch of emergencies crop up or unexpected expenses. Um, so I think it's a lot better to be honest with folks, see what they can, see what they need to, to fund their operations and then work with them on a plan to get that. And sometimes it's giving up from one department to another department's benefit. And uh, I think we have a pretty co cooperative um, group when it comes to that. And it's, it's really kind of fun to watch how everyone, <laughs> you know, will we'll try to chip in and help. And, some, you know, when we get out of the nitty gritty, it's sometimes it's just giving <laughs> $500 out of a supply line item, you know, to make something else happen in another department. I, I'll add to that too. Is at some point it's, it, it differs every year, but at various years, the city council will weigh in and say, you know, we're, we give you kind of a not to exceed cap, or or you know, there are certain things we want to see, uh, and so in those cases, of course, we make sure we deliver within the goods. In the last few years, it's the last couple of years at least, has been more of a give us your bottom line and then show us what. You remember last year we kind of had to add alternates. And the key point here is um, we'll, yeah, the, we'll be near the top of that range before we do any of the ads. Right. And the two, pri the two years preceding this year, we were looking at renewals that were right in the 3 to 4 percent. So um, it, it was wonderful coming off, you know, years back. Donna, you may remember, and as well. Um, you know, we had a couple of years where it was 16, 17 percent, and we thought that was the absolute most terrible scenario we could imagine. <laughs> Then we had a couple of good years. We started to get make traction or, or move forward on some different endeavors. And this year, we just you know can't be kicked. Um, Ashley, um, I, this may be a very naive question, and if it is, I am totally open to being told that. But um, well, I, I appreciate that health insurance is like literally life-saving. I've been there myself more more times than I would care to admit lately. But what I'm struggling with, and I think this is a, a bit of, maybe I'm just a little jaded, um, does the city have to buy from one of these insurers? Like, are we obligated to purchase from Blue Cross or Aetna, or could we explore a self insurance type option and hire someone to administer that plan so that we could actually, you know, like better meet our employees needs. And, uh, you know, again, I, I don't purport to know like what goes into all of that, but I, I really uh, struggle with the healthcare industry because they don't care about any of us. All they care about is money. And I would like to know that our city dollars are actually taking right. care of our city employees other than just paying, you know, mm -hmm. some jacked up insurance CEO, you know, has 25% bonus for the year while the rest of us are struggling to figure out how we can pay rent. So not a naive question at all, something that has um, been on the forefront of my thinking, <laughs> I think, since I've been in City Hall. We have pursued this from several different angles in terms of developing a self-insured um, funding model. Uh, and just this year through the league and Hickok and Boardman and trying to partner with South Burlington to create a captive insurance for health insurance. Um, due to regulatory issues and legal issues, there's a whole laundry list of reasons why we can't get there, at least in the near term. Um, it's optimistic that sometime in the future we might be able to, but the, the landscape from a regulatory and legal standpoint is changing so quickly that it's it's barring entry for us. Yes, we're making an assumption we have a country by then too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so it not a wonderful suggestion and I think we continue to explore those different angles as much as we could. The Can we, I, I don't no, mean to interrupt, no. I just, before I lose it, is it possible for, for Bill to pass on to the council what the list of reasons that we can't sure. are? I mm -hmm. just, I, I'm very curious yep. about that. I'll have that out tomorrow. Awesome. Um, Jack, did no. you have something? Okay. 
Um, I have a, a question about that. I mean, one of the possible solutions that's not going to help us this year, um, in my mind, is asking the legislature to up that number. You know how the limit for Vermont Health Connect is 100 employees. Um, we're at, what, 119? 100 and Correct. Okay. So, yeah. so um, if we could somehow lobby them. I mean, mm -hmm. we know that health care is broken. Mm -hmm. One possibility is that, you know, Vermont Health Connect could be, uh, you know, a, a place that we sort of ideally funnel, funnel um, you know, people into uh, over time. And if, if it was somehow, if that limit were higher mm -hmm. and we were able to qualify, I yeah. assume that would be us uh, joining just, a larger pool. Or just mm -hmm. allowing municipalities to join that pool, regardless of their size. Sure, that would be, that would be great. Um, so that that may be an option if we can convince yeah, the legislature yeah, to. Yeah, we could get some some traction okay. on opening that pool. I'm not holding my breath, but uh, you know, just trying to think about mm -hmm. options. Yeah. Um, other questions or comments about the budget? Um, I, I guess I'll just say from my perspective, uh, this is it, it. I mean, four and a half percent overall increase is that's significant mm -hmm. for us. Um, I don't, we're not in a place right now, I don't think, where we're going to go around and say, like, this is the percentage I feel comfortable with, yeah. or, um, you know, yeah, no, I think that you, we're not having that conversation right now, which, but we will. Um, and uh, I guess I'm just going to say for my part that uh, we're at the upper end of what I'm comfortable with. Um, and so I'm probably not going to be proposing anything new, um, you know, money wise. Uh, Probably, and I, um, I'm certainly open to other suggestions. Um, if you if you do have something, but um, I I'm not going to necessarily be bringing anything new for for this year. This feels like uh, could be, you know, kind of a maybe 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 wait a year. <laughs> but anyway, and, that's and you know as numbers get refined, you, you know, I'll be providing you additional information. Um, I guess. The thought that I would want to leave you with is that if there is a proposal for something new um, that requires spending in FY21, then just plan on there being a direct offset cut. So for everything that we had, something's going to go. Um, and you know, those are going to be the hard decisions. You know, it's no different than making um, you know changes in employees or eliminating positions or consolidating you know certain operations. Those become difficult. So the purpose of tonight's uh, discussion was just to get this information out to you so you have a chance to digest and kind of get a feel for what we're looking at. I have one further question. Um, the $100,000 that is going to impact mm -hmm. this year's budget, this mm -hmm. current year's budget, mm -hmm. uh, are we anticipating that we're going to be t taking that out of um, cost savings perhaps through this budget or from reserves? Or do we not know yet? Yeah, I don't want to make any that's know, okay. any commitments at this moment on, on how we'll actually pull that together. I want to make sure that I'm noting right. that I'm asking that, yeah. that question. Mm -hmm. um, Ashley, then Donna. I think, well, I already talked, so Donna. Mm. Okay. Um, so I heard you mention Hickok and, Hickok and Boardman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we have a contract with them? Or? We, no, they, they provide a health insurance uh, advisory service in conjunction with the league on okay. our behalf to, to assist in negotiating um, mm -hmm. renewals and, and insurance yeah, services. The League of Cities and Towns is the contract. We, it's a service we can access through them. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just wondering if if there are other ways that we could go about getting quotes because I, I I understand well I understand in theory how the insurance industry works I think that in practical reality I have no clue it's just some random process by which they either accept or deny a claim um, but I wonder if there might be other like different plans that are out there that sort of really focus on this kind of thing that, that we may be able to use. I, I'm not comfortable accepting a, an increase sure. like that. I, I, right. I really feel like that's just far too much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's great that we have this resource through the league, but I am certain there are other places out there. And I, I just, I can't accept a 25% a increase in premiums with no change in services. Mm -hmm. um, and, and frankly, uh, it, it sounds a little like they're using past bills to discriminate based on pre-existing conditions to price people out of the market, which I find reprehensible. 
Um, and you know, to me, there have to be other ways than than assuming a 25% increase to healthcare premiums. So we can give you more complete information. I think what we really understand is there's very few health insurers that do business in Vermont. It's basically MVP, Cigna, and Blue Cross Blue Shield. Yep. Period. That's the, the beginning and the end of the list. We've sought quotes from all three. We've we've been with Blue Cross. Uh, there, there's a long history here. I'll try to do it as quickly as I can, but I think it is relevant. Uh, for, for many years, the League of Cities and Towns had a pool of essentially all the towns and cities in the state were insured through their pool, and they bought insurance as a group. So I don't know, 7,000 employees, whatever they were, whatever the total was. And uh, they typically had been with Blue, Sh Blue Cross, and, and then a few years back, uh, they bid out the services, and, and Cigna won the bid. And so the, the pool switched to Cigna, as so most communities did and their employees did. And a year or two into it, uh, Blue Cross, obviously trying to get some business back, um, started approaching communities individually, particularly the larger communities and the uh, ones with the best claims records, uh, and offering them prices lower than what the pool was offering. And obviously, that's a tough call, right? You have an obligation to your taxpayers in your community, or do you, you know, sort of stay loyal with the pool? So many people took the the financial. And the, these were in the days of big increases, so people left the pool, which then left the pool with the high, the higher risk communities, higher risk employment pool, and so there, you know, you can imagine it started the death spiral, and so the pool started shattering. Yeah, we eventually had to break off to go to Blue Cross, and then along came, you know, right about that time was when Vermont Health Connect came in, and, and so for communities under 100, they can go into Health Connect. That left us now in a pool of our employees. We're not in with any other town or city. We're not in with any other larger group. Uh, so our 110 insureds, or well, and their families, so maybe 200 and some odd people, are the pool of, amongst which our claims are spread. So, you know, without, I mean, we had, you know, five claims that were the bulk of our overage. And, you know, as you say, we don't begrudge any of our employees using any of their insurance. That's what it's here for. People have catastrophic things happen to them. They need it. That's why we provide it. Um, but it doesn't take much when you're in such a small pool. And so I appreciate your concern. I actually agree with every bit of it philosophically. The fact is, it's, you know, Hick Hickok and Abortman is basically just a negotiating agent. They're not the provider. And so they're gonna negotiate with MVP, and they're gonna negotiate with Cigna, and they're gonna negotiate with Blue Cross, and maybe we'll get a better rate from one of them, and hopefully the coverage will be the same. We, we certainly have negotiated levels of coverage in our union contracts, we have to you know, we have to maintain that. I, I really do believe that the best r result in the long run would be if we could we could just raise the cap and be allowed to go into either to go into the Health Connect pool, or you know, ideally maybe the state of Vermont opens up its in employee plan to all municipalities, and let's you know just shares that. I don't know if they they will, but they could. Right. I mean, that would give them more insureds too to to broaden their pool. Uh, but those are those are really absent uh, uh, national change in the way healthcare is provided. Um, those are our, those are our very limited options. We're not in a state where you know we're a small state. There's not a huge amount of competition for this business, so we are somewhat captive. And it's you know October nine for a, a plan year starting January one. So even um, you know, it's just a it's a huge challenge. Well, I, we will we will bark up every tree, believe me. But uh, I just wanted to be clear that that's kind of the we're we're a small player in a big field, and so we're not you know and and we're coming off a bad claim year, so we're not um, juicy fruit for an insurance company. Well, I I totally understand that that's the way the system does work, but I think that's a not working system oh, yes. for us, and Absolutely. and so. I agree. I, <laughs> I guess I'm just going to continue to be that like we need to find other solutions person because I I just I can't fathom just right. sort of saying that well there's nothing else that we can do other than this like cuz I we have a this is a loud group of people who can you know make phone calls and and you know like speak up about this if if we're being told that our only option to keep our employees healthy is to pay 25% more 
to me, for, for the exact same thing, like that's unacceptable. And, and, and to be clear, it impacts employees because their yeah, share is yeah. also going up 25%. Which is mm -hmm. uh, just unconscionable yeah. that insurance companies are uh, right. legally permitted to do this. So, but I, I just, I would really encourage us to not just sort of accept that as the status, like no. the status quo isn't good enough because all of us deserve better because we are humans. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm not going to vote on a tax increase of, of nearly Four percent. Well, well, not an increase of. Well, yeah, it would be close, close, close to a four percent increase for residents who are already struggling to be here anyway. I, and I just that to me is sort of how we continue to end up in this endless cycle of like we need more people, but we also need money to keep up the services that we all value. And this is one to me where the money is not staying in Vermont. I, I feel pretty strongly that when we you know are, are going to be talking about an expenditure of that size, we do everything within our power to uh, mitigate those costs because that's that's just un, unbelievable. Donna. Well, unfortunately, I was around in 2000 when we had 24% almost every year. It was ridiculous. And we started those HMOs and savings accounts. And that shook things up for a while. And then up it goes again. And the theater got their increase already. Um, Jack, I don't know why, but we got our notice that our, ours was going up, and it's 16%. And we've had no claims on this, on the group that's actually insured direct. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, it's great that we can try to do something. I think it's too bad we got this notice after the, the Vermont League of City and Towns had their, fair, their town meeting, because this is an issue the towns and the league could really put their teeth into. And I think we, yeah, and we need to go forward. And join with towns and the league to, to approach legislators. But the market is what it is. And Vermont has a small market because Vermont says they have to accept pre existing conditions. And so the other insurance companies left. So I'm glad Vermont did that, but it's a free market. So the other, everybody else left. Well, I think it's time for us to. I, I, no, no, I agree. I think we have I to just, act. We got yep. to take that power back because I am done letting them write that narrative of life in our community and, frankly, every other one out there. Um, I have a question. What, uh, what would you think about the council writing uh, some kind of a letter to um, support? I mean, you're raising it with the league. The I'm league. on the league board. And yeah. um, would it them. be more powerful or helpful if we had some kind of a letter that we all agreed to? Uh, um, I, I would also ask that we send this to departments head, department heads to distribute to em employees because, I mean, this could be a potential impact on them as well. And so, um, you know, our, our employees are literally what keeps us all being here, you know. Um, they keep the lights on for us. They keep our streets safe and clean. Like, and, and to me, like, we need to let everybody in the community know that. Yeah. That's so, so you'd be in favor of a, having some kind of a letter. A memo. Um, I would say a memo to city staff. Well, that, yeah, we would do that anyway. Yeah. And, but, but now rather than because right. I think city staff have an important voice in this process. Well, and I'm I'm talking about a letter to um, request that the either municipalities uh, be allowed to join Vermont Health Connect or that the cap uh, on 100 employees be raised. Is that what? It, yes. Does that yes. sound yes. okay? And um, is that something? I mean, I don't I'd know. Do you need? That. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yes, Connor. I mean, I, I think I would prefer some discussion with the bargaining units just yeah. before drafting this, just mm -hmm. to get their input. Does it make sense to like draft something <coughs> and circulate it around, get feedback on it, um, and before before we have a vote? So does that sound reasonable? We can, so I'll, I'll let you know. We have already informed the bargaining units and, and employees that this is coming. I mean, we don't have a final number yet, but this isn't necessarily a shock. To, you know, they know it's, it's happening. We, I, I, sorry, so while I think it would be good to inform them that we're doing that, we can't, we can't change plans unless it meets certain criteria based on our, our contract. So we would still be bound by that. So even if we were to go to health, so our contracts, don't specify which provider, it specifies okay. levels of care. So as long as we were purchasing a similar level of care through Health Connect at a lower rate, it, we would be meeting our obligations to our collective bargaining units. Do, do they have any voice in selecting the provider? I know state employees do. So, you know, we have what we do actually, so they do not necessarily via their contract, 
um, because actually we have a very good working relationship with them in, in terms of that. We have an employee health insurance committee that, that has a rep from all the unions and non-unions, and these type of issues are wrestled in that group. You know, we're such a small group that it doesn't make sense for, you know, fire to have one provider and one set of plan and police. So it's got to be kind of an all or nothing. So we get everyone together and resolve this that way. And so typically when we switch providers, it is with those groups. We're all doing it together. Uh, and so I would argue that having the option to go to Health Connect or having the option to do something else doesn't necessarily mean we have to do it, but it gives us another cho set of choices that we don't have right now that the employees and us would, would consider. And we'd be happy to share. I'm not saying we shouldn't share the letter with them, but I think we ought to we could move ahead without violating their trust. I don't think they want to pay 25% more either. No, no. Yeah. I, I would just feel a little more comfortable if they get a look at it before yeah, we yeah, draft sure. anything. Um, well, if we draft it and then they can provide feedback, is that okay? Yep. Okay. Uh, all right, so um, I don't think we need a motion on that, but uh, we'll talk about that at another another meeting um, after people have had a chance to, to check it out. Um, any other comments about the budget? If not, that's okay. Thanks for bringing us this good news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so it goes. It's been agonizing. Yeah. Um, um, but this is very sobering because we're four, only four months, people, in this FY year, just so you realize that. Yeah. And we've already dug out $10,000 of money from departments. Mm -hmm. We have a winter to go through, so it's not going to look better. No, no. And, it's, and Ashley, t just to address your point before I, I leave, you know, looking at wholesale plan changes um, is, is something that's discussed every year um, with the professionals and the health insurance committee. But unfortunately, because the bulk of our claims were produced by a very finite group of individuals, those changes don't translate into savings to the insurance providers. Um, until we're our way, own insurance the way, provider. Right, and, and ideally, I mean, there are, there are so many opportunities within the self-insured um, arena that we could actually take control of some of our health insurance costs um, and uh, lots of models to work with. It's very exciting. We're just not quite there. So. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. All right, moving on to the Responsible Employer Ordinance. So we have a, a draft... Uh, um, attached, uh, and uh, Connor, do you want to say anything about this? Ah, sure, I could go on for hours, I think, like I have last <laughs> time, but I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, just first off, thanks very much to the council for making this a priority in this year. Uh, thanks very much to city staff who offered really helpful comments, which I've incorporated into this draft. A lot of them, again, I think this is an issue of dignity. Um, you know, I think as a city we've always seen employees as more than just numbers on a spreadsheet and want to get down to the yeoman level on this. Um, it would certainly be preposterous if there was a state project that, like the DMV where workers were making one wage and getting a certain level of benefits. And then just down the street, you would have a city project where it was an entirely different set of uh, benefits and uh, wages there. So I, I think this takes that into consideration. Um, it, it's an approach that we haven't seen many municipalities take in Vermont. Uh, but again, I hope we can be a beacon that others will follow in that regard. Uh, just getting right into the draft here. Um, again, there were several suggestions by the city staff. And I do want to pass out the prevailing wage uh, rates uh, set by the state here. Have that handy. And, and this, is, this is the one issue I, you know, I tried to be creative. There was a suggestion, could we do some sort of minimum wage or livable wage? Uh, that would take into consideration all these job classifications. And, and at the end of the day, I don't think it's feasible. You know, you, you, you have different sets of jobs, like an electrician, for example, would require 900 hours uh, of classroom time to reach that goal, and 8,000 hours just being in the field working on projects. Uh, you, you, you stack that next to a helper, which is another classification which is somebody who just shows up at the job without any of these qualifications. Um, I, I don't think you can get a minimum wage that would accommodate both those jobs. And you, you can see just by looking through the, the, the packet here, there's a good number of jobs here. Um, the prevailing wage, we, we've also uh, mentioned the AGC, the Association of General Contractors. 
Uh, this was actually established collaboratively between the Vermont Building Trades and the general contractors in early 19, uh, 1916, 2016. Uh, it's, it's very old. It's very old. There's quite a bit of precedent here. <laughs> So it was developed collaboratively to reach a state rate there, and uh, I, I, I think our best approach is just to mirror that. So that was the first concern. You can see it, section 6.4. Uh, there was some confusing language in my initial draft, which references collective bargaining agreements. Um, we scrapped that and just said the Vermont prevailing wage, which is on the Department of Labor website. It's easily available. I think it's easy to understand. Um, if you look at the last sen sentence in 6.4, six, uh, uh, responsible wages shall only apply to construction trade, trade workers working directly on the specified construction projects. Um, there was a really good point made that, okay, does this refer to office personnel who, who, who might be working in some of these, uh, you know, bigger corporations here? Uh, we want to be specific that it's only the, the specified construction project there, so generally they're on the work site. Uh, but we tried to word that in a way that if somebody's, something's being manufactured off-site, it would still apply in that case. Uh, workers' compensation, 6.5, a uh, bit clearer than industrial accident insurance. Go to 6.11. Um, yeah, the, you know, the thought of stopping a construction project automatically, uh, that is a bit scary to <laughs> fathom there. <laughs> So just change it to after a reasonable period of time, uh, you could provide an opportunity to correct or cease work on a project until compliance is obtained. So then it's in control of the city. You have the mechanism to stop a project, but that doesn't necessarily be need to be where you need to go on that. So it's at the discretion of the city there. So I think that, that encompasses most of the city points. Uh, we had a previous memo by Sue Allen. I think we went through one by one. Uh, last meeting there, so I don't know if anybody has any questions for me. There's much more qualified people in the crowd who can answer some of those. Uh, but again, I think this is big. This is, uh, you know, Montpelier really spearheading something that we haven't seen in the state. It's sending a message that, you know, if you build this city, you know, Danielle's in the crowd. She said, we built this town. We should be able to afford to live here as well. So I would hope that would keep some of the folks from the city from the state actually working on these projects um, and not necessarily having people from, you know, New Hampshire coming in um, and keeping Vermonters on it. So I'll stop there again. I could talk for hours on this. Um, and I think there's probably going to be some comments from the crowd. Um, I know, Ashley, you have a comment, but I'd also love to hear from Donna. Um, you had some comments last time, and I just want to follow up with, with you about that as well. Um, but Ashley, in the meanwhile. Yeah. Um, I just. Uh, Looking at section 6.4 in the proposed draft, I want to make clear, though, that um, with in so that first sentence, the bidder or proposer and subcontractors under the bidder or proposer must comply with the minimum obligation. So I don't want this to be a situation where in some strange world an employer says, oh, all I have to pay is, is that, but you know, I, I'm, so I'm gonna cut a wage to match that because it pays, I, I, I just favor clear drafting and so as long as we say that they will pay, um, comply with the minimum obligation, so at least, so it can be nothing like, at least not, not, the, not the top end, so that doesn't make it like the top end of the spectrum, it starts, I just wanna reframe it as that's where you must start. So you'd propose that Minimum obligations. They insert the word minimum before obligations. Right. Must yeah. comply with at least the minimum obligations. That seems reasonable. Do you, you, you agree there? Yeah. And so that uh, way nobody can say, well, I didn't have to pay more. Right, right, right. right. Or, or I wanted to pay more, but right. I oh, couldn't because this was, yeah. Like Glenn. Uh, only just because we're talking about the language of 6.4. Um, it feels to me like that first long sentence may still have some language in it that, that uh, to, to me it feels redundant. And I guess I'm, my question is uh, whether we need to refer to the Vermont prevailing wage law twice. So I think you'll hear it if I read it out quickly. Um, let's say the bidder must comply with the obligations established by the city for payment of a responsible wage which shall effectively incorporate the rates set under the Vermont prevailing wage law applicable the regional rates for the Montpelier area as calculated in accordance with Vermont's prevailing wage law 
including the appropriate apprentice. So that, that first reference feels to me like it doesn't, we, we could say instead, um, which shall infect, effectively incorporate uh, the regional rates for the Montpelier area as calculated in accordance with Vermont's uh, prevailing wage law, including the appropriate apprentice classification. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I don't want to cut something out that needs to be there, but I just didn't understand it the way it was I'm written. Sure exactly. we'll hear okay. So, can, can I just weigh in on a technical point here? Um, we have not yet had this vetted by our attorneys. We we're going to make sure we were going to, uh, you know, we still have to do a first and second reading for an ordinance adoption. I think sense will see where the council was comfortable. If they wanted to move ahead, what what the substance was going to be. So I think those, those are good points, but we don't necessarily have to draft the wording right now other than if there are key policy points you want to make sure to get in. Uh, and then whenever we set this for, if, assuming you want to go ahead, if we set it for first reading, we will have, have, have it legally reviewed. And if there's major concerns, we'll of course let that know. But I don't, I don't think there will be, but nonetheless. We, Which attorney would be point on this bill? I haven't decided yet. We, okay. We're in the process of changing some of them, so. Jack. You got a recommendation? And then, and then I want to check in with Donna after. Yeah, good. Just based on what's on the agenda, did we open the public it's hearing? Not it's not actually a public hearing. It's a discussion. It says it does pub said first hold public, public hearing. hearing. Oh. And recommended action says hold public hearing. So it's fine with me to have this not be the public hearing. <laughs> but yeah. just, okay. if it is, we should that's, that's, yeah, that's the agenda fair. itself actually just says preliminary discussion. If, and then I, I uh, believe we voted to have a public hearing, though, at the 9-11 meeting. <laughs> I think we did. I know well, we said to bring it back. I, if we did, that was our, my error. Right? I think that really just means that we're allowing the public to speak on it, right. so it doesn't hurt. Um, but I think we also probably should still, you know, warn it as a formal first reading and with this, you know to with the same same ordinance process that we would normally go through once we've got it reviewed by a lawyer so um, yeah is that okay that so, so we would have a first public hearing in two weeks yes. and then a second in another two weeks right. and then it'll be approved yes okay, okay. <laughs> uh, Donna if you if you don't mind um, just quickly um, I think the language got revised according to what was discussed the last time. I think there's some numbering um, changes that could be made to make it more succinct, but I assume that would happen once the lawyers took a look at it. So. But you are comfortable with the intent and uh, general uh, way this the, the mechanisms here work? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Excellent. Well, that's, that's important to me. Yeah, go ahead, Donna. Um, I have a question of how this relates to a livable wage ordinance. Are we, uh, is the council assuming we're doing a separate, totally isolated this and then that? Um, I thought they were going to maybe be more integrated. I, my understanding from the last meeting, because I had that same <coughs> wondering um, where I landed, and I, you know, uh, I'm just one person here, so, you know, other thoughts, it's really welcome, but um, my thought had, or what I thought I understood coming out of the last meeting uh, was that we were going to try this um, and give it, a, give it a go, give it some time, and then see how it might be expanded or um, framed into something larger once this was in place. Because this was so ready to go that we didn't want to delay it to, uh, you know, try, try to expand it all in, in one shot. But if I'm misunderstanding that, then I'm open to being wrong. <laughs> I mean, it bothers me that it's just construction because it's also predominantly a male profession. So it just seems rather isolating. That's all. Well, and I, I don't want to give up the, um, you know, the, the idea that we're, might be pursuing something larger, even so. I would argue this prevents gender discrimination in this workplace, so maybe it won't be as male-dominated if we pass it. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to officially open a public hearing um, on this. Um, so, any comments from the public uh, on this topic? 
Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Tom Abdelnour. I am a proud resident, as always, of the Montpelier Fight and Third uh, Council District. And uh, I wanted to come out tonight to speak uh, very much in favor of this ordinance. Uh, one of the reasons I am proud to live in Montpelier is it's a place uh, that values taking care of our own. It's a place that values workers' rights. And I really feel that the city of Montpelier should um, operate as the gold standard when it comes to labor issues among municipalities in the state. Um, and I think that those are views that are shared by the members of this council, which is why I'm sure you'll all be so supportive of this uh, ordinance. But um, the purpose of regulations like these is in the God forbid situation that should come in the future that the people on this council do not have those values so deeply ingrained that we're simply codifying what we would hope that our elected officials would always do, which would be to operate in a responsible and ethical manner when it came to the people that were building the projects um, that the city was undertaking. And uh, I heard the budget debates before, and uh, I know people are concerned about um, the cost of various proposals, but I guess I would argue that any proposal um, any project that the city would undertake of a construction nature uh, for which it did not feel it had the resources to contract with people who were going to be performing that in a responsible way, in a way that cares about um, the labor issues at stake, is a project that the, the city really can't afford in the first place. So I really think it's important moving forward that uh, any major undertaking that the city would, would go f forward with uh, would, would keep these values in mind. And I think this ordinance is a good way of making sure that happens. So I think there are a lot of other people who want to speak. I'll keep it short. Thanks Thank so, you much. so much. Hello again. This is my third time here, uh, Danielle Bombardier from Colchester. And thanks again for having us here speaking. I understand now it's not the first public hearing, but I'll speak anyway. Um, I've often, when I've been here the last two times, I've compared a responsible contractor ordinance to a union contract, and I'm a union electrician. The only reason I compare those two is because they are, in fact, both a contract. Um, so responsible contractor ordinance in no way guarantees that a union contractor would get a job um, on one of those jobs. All it does is uh, level the playing field so that a contractor bidding those projects is actually providing a real livable wage to their employees on that job. Um, and as a point of clarification, when you look through uh, this packet, it does show you a wage associated with a classification of worker. Um, on top of that wage is 42.5% added in for a benefit calculation. So um, if the contractor is not paying a benefit, health insurance or retirement, um, PTO, that goes into the wage. So someone who uh, is listed at $21 an hour is actually making something about $30 an hour. So it's, it's above and beyond a livable wage. It's an actual livable wage so they can get off of social welfare, health insurance, um, and actually afford what they need to, to have a, a, a modest way of life. I mean, it's not above modest in any instance. Um, so I strongly support this ordinance. Um, I think it raises the standard for contractors who often um, are underpaying their employees. And you're spending um, your own money, your taxpayer money. And I think that um, Montpelier can really make an example by um, ensuring that when your money is spent, it's supporting the workers in your city as well. Um, to address a question uh, from the city last meeting, um, there have been at least 39 reports by major colleges, academics, and other reputable institutes and researchers, and they've shown that while prevailing wage laws increase the hourly labor cost, which has a real impact on the worker's life, they do not have a real impact on the total project cost. So typically if um, the workers are getting more money, the workers are getting more money, but the total cost of the project is not significantly um, higher. Uh, what happens without a responsible contractor ordinance is that the owner of that company is just making more money themselves. So um, I believe also that having this ordinance, you will get a higher quality product because your workers on your city projects will be 
more satisfied. So I support it, and I'll be back in two weeks and four weeks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. It, it, it is three weeks, right? Um, I guess I just want to make clear, for, for me, my yes vote on this um, is, is so much, it's, it's about helping Montpelier, but it's because it's who we are as Montpelier. And I want to send that message that, you know, we're not going to undercut what our people are worth, like what human beings are worth, what their work is worth, what their time is worth, the time that they don't get to spend with their families. Um, and I'm super excited that we are starting with something like this. I think this, you know, the, the framework existed for this. And so I really want to thank you, Connor, for not only, you know, thinking about who you know, who the people are that we will be hopefully positively impacting with this, but also that it reflects really, I believe, who we all are as, as people in our community and uh, the value that labor unions have brought to Montpelier over the years and, uh, frankly, the, the value that they continue to bring to all of us here. Hi, hey everyone. Um, my name is Mike Smith. I am the Iron Workers Local 7 business agent covering Vermont, and uh, I want to applaud the council for taking up this cause. I. Uh, I've been to a lot of hearings in a lot of cities and towns with responsible employer language. Um, I think it's very important for us as an industry to have these kind of protections. Um, many times in the construction industry, the best way to, to get cheaper on your price is to gouge your employees. And we find that over and over. And there's a saying in the industry that if you're not cheat, you keep, if you don't cheat, you can't compete. And uh, that's, it's a sad reality for a lot of, of the uh, brother and sister iron workers out in the field. And there are a lot of sister iron workers. Local 7 is proud <laughs> that uh, we have more women iron workers than any other local in the country. So, and, uh, and, and we're, we're always through active outreach getting better and better. And uh, I think that the, um, that wall that, that used to exist does not exist anymore. And what's, what's your percentage? Um, it, we're actually just over 7%. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, it's... Good. Well, Good. we're trying to turn a corner, but to tell you the truth, we've never denied a woman applicant. They've I always say been it's accepted. Fault. I say no, I know, anybody. but, you know, I wanted to explain that, that we always have better work to do. We know that. We're, but we're improving every year. And, um, but this, this kind of language and these, these um, responsible... These projects have like economic multipliers that 1.6 times to two times the project price will end up back in the community. And that money changes hands many times in the local community. So if I make money from that project, I'll spend it in the local community and the local community businesses will make money from that project and they'll spend it in the local community. And it stays in the local community. This ensures that we don't have to cut corners on workers' comp and safety and worker training to, to get these projects. We want to be competitive in this, in this space, in, in this industry. Um, we, hands down, we have the best trained workforce in the industry. We're the safest. Our safety record is, is second to none. Um, but we can't compete with a lot of the contractors and a lot of these big projects because we just can't get low enough on the cost. Um, so, you know, it's it's responsible for a community to, to take up this cause. Because we make sure that, that our members aren't gonna be going to the cities and towns and the states to get their health insurance. When they retire, they will have a modest retirement income that they won't have to go and get on some sort of welfare program or ask for handouts. And uh, they retire with dignity. And you know, I, I, can't, I can't ask enough that, that you guys look at this and, and you just stay on the, and stay on the course and, and vote this into a law. Thanks. Hello again. Uh, Larry Moquin, Swan, Vermont. I'm an organizer with the Laborers Union. I represent a couple hundred people between Vermont and New Hampshire. I'm here to support this ordinance. Um, the state supported this for a reason because not many of you may know, but if you guys want to look into federal Davis-Bacon wages in this state, um, a flagger, for example, who a couple have been, you know, sadly killed in the line of duty, makes 11 11 an hour with no fringe benefits in this state. A laborer in Chittenden County, by federal Davis-Bacon laws, makes less per hour than a laborer in the Northeast Kingdom. 
Um, it's just problems that nobody was educated on and we're trying to do our best to. I think it'd be great to do this. To tell you the truth, it's probably not going to help my members because our collective bargaining agreement is way above this because we take care of our people. But I think it'll be great for all the people that don't know what they have an opportunity to receive by being a little organized. And another thing, last time you guys asked me to get some non-union construction workers to come in here, um, I tried. They saw it on the news last time, said they would not be seen here speaking against their employer because simply they are afraid to do that here, and that's a problem. So once again, please support this. Um, you'll, you'll be doing good for many more Vermonters than you guys really realize. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah. Peter Kalman, Montpelier. Um, I, uh, I've written to city council members and to Connor about uh, my concerns, and they are related to uh, the question that Don asked. But let me be clear at the outset that I'm definitely in favor of Montpelier adopting a carefully considered, data-driven, appropriately designed, and clearly worded responsible employer ordinance. So my question is, what is the hurry to do it now? This is very important. And since it's important, it should be done well. We should be very sure that the wording is correct, legal, et cetera, and it will be looked at by, 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 by lawyers for that reason. But we should also make sure that there are no unintended outcomes and that it is data driven. A lot of people are talking about city projects. What city projects are we talking about? Are we talking about the road work that's being done? Are we talking about the garage that might be built? Are we talking about projects where there is city money in it, but it's not a city project, like Taylor Place? So some of these issues need to be very carefully addressed and worded properly. So my real question is, like as Donna brought up, why only construction contractors and their employees? Why not include all or most contractors with the city or the city itself as an employer? Why are we picking this one thing? Is it a test run? If it's a test run, let's be clear that it's a test run and let's be really very careful that it's a good test. Where is the data? References to, for example, uh, money being recirculated in the community. Would that, in fact, happen in Montpelier? Where are the workers on the Montpelier work sites from? Do they live in Montpelier? And the answer is, well, no, they can't afford to. Well, OK, but how is that recirculating of the money, that multiplier effect, actually going to happen? Um, I have suggested that uh, the city uh, manager's office develop a list of what projects might be appropriate, how many employees might be affected by, by this, how many would, if just, just take a look back at the last five years or look forward to things that we know are gonna happen. Let's take the time to do this right. I am for it, but I am not for rushing through it because of some sense of urgency that I don't quite get. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wasn't going to speak, but to rebut to that is uh, this is not in a hurry. I've worked if on you'd that. Also, uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing Vermont yourself. state prevailing wage rates, which you have, to get the forty-two and a half percent for twenty-six okay. years. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Tim LaBombard, IBW Local three hundred. I work with. Danielle and uh, Jasmine, which is, there's 50%. Scott's here too. He's uh, one of us, so 50% male, female. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's just, it's very near and dear to my heart. And our contractors, as Larry said, we pay more. But we want to bring up all, you know, tides raise the rates for everybody. But uh, it's just wrong when. There's people out there with no benefits going, working 
uh, 10,000 hours in the trade, 1,080 hours apprenticeship, nights, two nights a week, going to class, working 12 hours a day, and getting 16 or $18 an hour not being able to afford. I think it's wrong. And this was vetted by more attorneys than we can think about with the state of Vermont, okayed by the AJC, which is Associated General Contractors, and the Vermont Construction Building Trades, which are non-union union sides, and a good contractor, which most of them are, want to pay their help, livable wages, which is these wages, um, Burlington's livable wage is it's just a high minimum wage. Uh, but if you have this, it keeps everybody honest, and the good contractors are paying this, and it's just, uh, it's not a rush by any means. It's too late it's for some people. Thank you. I'm Sheila Healy. <laughs> Most of you know that because I used to work here. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to say I, I, uh, I, I'm, uh, you know, I've been working out of town for a little bit, uh, but I came home tonight because I, I'm so excited that y'all are talking about this. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a really beautiful thing about our town. I moved here a few years ago, um, and I've I've never found a place where you know people treat each other with such kindness and dignity and respect and it's just something so unique about this place that I've never found anywhere else um, and and I couldn't I just couldn't think of a better way to live our values than than to you know codify that everybody gets treated with dignity and respect and kindness um, beyond this wonderful city council who I love so thank you very much thank you. <laughs> okay so um, the path forward, it, as it seems to me, is um, to um, perhaps have a motion to ask the city manager to have this reviewed by a lawyer um, with uh, the changes suggested tonight and then set the first public hearing for, as the, for this um, at, the, at our next meeting. So moved. Put the mayor second. Second. <laughs> okay. okay. Is there a second? Oh, there is okay. Um, further discussion. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. All right. Thank you all. Thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you for all of your work on on this. And looking forward to uh, the next meeting where we get to uh, have our first official public hearing with this as the um, ordinance ready to go. And again, I'll just say if, if I messed that up oh, on the thank you. So first gonna, hearing that was on me. So I apologize. I, I misunderstood. And I'm going to officially close the public hearing on that. Can we have a break? Uh, yeah. Particular issue to uh, potentially revise. Um, so, and actually, the, there's an issue here about whether this is a third public hearing or, or, or what. Um, so, Jack, did you have a thought on that? Yeah, go ahead. I do have a thought on that, and I talked to the mayor about it the other night. Um, the uh, it's listed on the agenda as third public hearing for chapter eight however uh, reference to our minutes from last time will show that we actually adopted the ordinance um, at the last time so there's nothing to hold a public hearing on so what i think we should do is schedule a public hearing uh, to for for an amendment on of of this ordinance because we uh, the background for anyone listening we uh, we adopted an ordinance limiting uh, uh, farm animals to 10 uh, parcels of 10 acres we got a very well reasoned uh, communication from uh, Rosie Kruger pointing out why we were wrong to do it the way we did yep Sorry, <laughs> and, uh, and and I think they've identified a, a real problem that with uh, the action we took, and we should um, address it. And so, I move that we schedule a public hearing on a proposed amendment to Chapter Eight. So, so can I just offer a suggestion yes, that you could still discuss the the content? of what you wanted to put in it, even if you're enacting it tonight, mm -hmm. so that we could, if you choose, and then when we warn the hearing, it would be the way that you wanted it, and it could be de dealt with. So I think there's What's folks here that want to talk about it, and we could get it right. So yeah. With that understanding, 
Second. <laughs> so just to be clear, your uh, motion is to schedule a, basically a, another first public hearing. For the amendment. For, for the, the amendment. And you don't need yeah. to do two necessarily for every amendment. So oh, you, okay. could, you could amend it. could just be the next. Because you've already, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Um, so there's a motion and a second. One possibility is that we could approve this and then talk about it, or we can talk about it and then approve it. So we talk about it first. Talk about it first. I, I think that's a good idea. So, um, so anyway, there's a motion and a second. Thoughts on um, the language change? Uh, Donna. I mean, when we foolishly passed it, we had concern about the 10 acres, but we wanted to at least put it out there. <laughs> Maybe next time we won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair. Fair. It's a bit to learn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, other comments? Or from the public? I'm going to officially, I think it was listed as a public hearing, so I'm going to officially open the public hearing. Even though it's number three. Um, thoughts on this language? Uh, Lauren. I would just express my appreciation for the, um, <laughs> the, the suggestions, which um, seem very thoughtful and like a good step forward in addressing the issue without creating um, kind of arbitrary lines that seem to potentially problematic. So just thanks for that and happy to move forward with this new um, iteration. Agreed. Any other comments? Glenn? Uh, I want to just mentioned that Laura Smith Riva, who's in the audience there, uh, has a fantastic uh, uh, parcel of land up on Berlin Street with some sheep on it. And uh, I had a very useful conversation with her in the development of this whole uh, process, let's say, uh, to be generous. It is still a process. Uh, and um, got a lot of good advice on um, how we should think about this, uh, and, and um, I'm really glad that you all showed up, and I'm sorry that it looks like you may have to come back again, but you're great, so um, see, you, see you again then, too. <laughs> Feel free to talk while you're here. I'm Laura Smith-Riva. I live up on Berlin Street. I do have um, some livestock up there and um, ten, 10 sheep right now. My lot is 9.65 acres according to the deed. And so when I heard about this, I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, and we checked the ordinance before we bought the place. We were very careful about this. And when we built our chicken coop, we checked the ordinance related to the size of that structure to make sure we would be in compliance. Um, so I felt that it was a little bit maybe tone deaf for the council to have voted on something like that without, you know, I really appreciated that Glenn reached out and approached me and, um, and, that, and actually took the time to walk up that hill, Donna which- Donna pushed me to do it. <laughs> So, <laughs> Who did? Donna, yeah, Donna. yeah. That's right. He mentioned that. I appreciate that the council was like, maybe we should talk to some of the people who actually are farming. Um, I think that was a good idea because uh, I I do think that the uh, the ten acre um, minimum doesn't really speak to the issues and 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 achieves an objective of potentially styming. Um, reasonable uh, farming operations, agricultural operations that could happen within the city limits. And I, I think that when, and I'm sure Glenn could share more about it, when we talked about what we're doing, I took him down and showed him our operation and talked a lot about what we do. And I did this work on much larger pieces of land and smaller pieces of land. <laughs> And uh, I grew up on a farm in Vermont, and I have farmed here in Vermont for the last, uh, I guess, the last 13 years or so. And um, I know what we can do with that piece of land. And so my hope is that if the city is looking at revising ordinances that you know, I sort of feel like if it ain't broke, don't fix it a little bit. You know, I, I understand the intent. I also am aware that I don't think there's been any kind of formal complaints about farming activities, and maybe I'm wrong about that. I think that sounded like to be the case. Um, so I'm in favor so we, of, we you know. We did have one issue with a, mm -hmm. a pig in a, in a 
downtown area in a small lot and recently the, within the last two or three years uh -huh. and there was neighbor complaints and that, that led to one of the concerns honestly because it just said if it's offensive or something and it was very vague and so the question is what what triggers enforcement and I think we were just seeking clarity not to really change the rules of the road per se and maybe say okay in the small little postage lots you know down, downtown lots we shouldn't have this stuff but otherwise so we appreciate any feedback Can yeah so uh, yeah carry on uh yeah i would argue a pig isn't offensive <laughs> but the manner in which one keeps it could be <laughs> the manner in which in which one is kept i mean one of the things that glenn and i talked about was animal welfare we had a third party certification for years with our farm. We were one of the first. We got several of the facilities in the state of Vermont certified animal welfare approved. And, um, and so for me, that's always a, a big concern. We don't address it. Um, but there are a lot of really, really good standards out there that probably would address some of the issues about stocking density and things like that that might be of concern. So um, I guess I'm in favor of less restrictive language that allows people to, um, to engage in agricultural operations. We are an agricultural state. We have a, you know, and I don't, I, I got the sense that the city council was not intent upon trying to limit agricultural operations in, in the city limits. It, it was more about cleaning up the ordinance, I guess. Um, and the effect was that a vote was taken that did a provider restriction. So I had, when I spoke to Glenn, I said I'd like to I know if I need to make a formal request to, to revisit this ordinance. I did understand that it had been voted on. I was told that that probably wasn't necessary, but I indicated I'm going to come to the meeting because I want to be sure that um, I have an opportunity to be heard. So I, I mean, I guess I don't want to propose any specific language. There's, there is some on the table. Um, I offered to sit on any committee that might discuss it. I'll have a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. Have you gotten a chance to look at the proposed language? Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts on how functional that mm -hmm. would be? I mean, for me, it would be totally functional. I don't have a problem with anything that's in there. I mean, one thing I said to Kevin was like, what do you mean by other wild pests? You know. The fox who comes to take your chicken is at a wild past, yeah. um, but you know. So I didn't quite know what that part meant. Felt a little bit vague. Um, I'm trying to remember the rest of the language, which I do have it here. Yeah, no fair. Uh, yeah. Well, I have it right here on my phone. No, no livestock or other domestic animals shall be kept in a manner that one causes the discharge of uh, the discharge of waterways. Oh. Discharge, I guess I don't have the exact language here, hold on. Here. I'll, I'll the discharge of manure or other agricultural waste into public waterways, roads, or onto neighboring properties creates a persistent offensive odor resulting in the discomfort of neighboring residences or causes infestation of rodents, flies, or other wild pests. It's not, it's, it's not a problem for me where I live. I don't, I'm not, I can't speak for others, but um, I don't have a problem with with any of this language. I mean, I again, I like to see stuff related to the welfare of the animals and something to consider and think about um, because that, that actually will have the effect of achieving other objectives once you begin to look at how animals are kept and cared for. Um, while you're up, do you think that the city should, <coughs> should add language to that effect, or is your opinion that, that there's adequate oversight, for example, at the state level of things like that? Mm -hmm. I don't know what the state uh, the state regulations are off the top of my head. I haven't looked at it, but I know from getting the certification, animal welfare approved, that if they're following anything that the USDA's got, it's probably not, not very good. I mean, we know what happens with uh, a lot of uh, farming operations, which Vermont doesn't have as much of that kind of stuff because we're a small state. We don't have massive you know, pork farms and, and cattle feedlots and things like that. Fair enough. Well, and I appreciate your, um, your thoughts on this and, and you know, I agree, you know, other wild pests might be a little vague, but um, 
I mean, you know, I mean, one of the um, you know, ways that we got here was trying to think of like, okay, what was the uh, the original intent of that section of language, and does this? Uh, I mean, the the original language had to do just with with pigs, and so it, it it's morphed into to this. But hopefully, this still um, you know gets at uh, the original um, you know issue, which was uh, you know a nuisance in town um, that was um, bothering neighbors. Um, I guess the I one the one other thing, yeah. yeah, that yeah, is ahead. maybe you know when I think about pigs, we we kept pigs for years, and um, it's all about keeping them contained, um, and and if they're if they have enough room, your stocking density isn't high. The odor is, is not an issue. It's not a problem. But, you know, there's nothing in here that talks about keeping your livestock corralled. And I think with what happened down in Orange with the pig farmer Sugar, uh, Sugar uh, Mountain, Walter Jeffries of Sugar Mountain, whose pigs got loose and were loose for weeks, running havoc through the town, that that was uh, something that, you know, and he like took off for a conference or something and just left them and, you know, because they're, they can be hard to catch, but you know, we, we had pigs get out, you know, a couple of times over the years and we raised them in, in Huntington and in Danville. We don't have any now, though we'd like to raise a couple. Um, but you know, it's, you, you have to like, as a farmer, it's about making sure you're taking care of those animals you can't just like, oh, they got out, you know, because they can be a danger to others. Now, accidents happen, but, you know, I'm, I remember there was a farm in Vermont where the cattle kept getting out, and then finally somebody hit one with a car, and somebody died, you know. So, like, there are, or was badly injured, I don't remember. I tend to exaggerate, so maybe, <laughs> I don't know. But I, he, no, maybe I, he didn't I, die, I, I but. I think I remember that story. I feel like he might have. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's like no, not a good situation. Right, not good for the animal or for the, for the people yeah. in the vehicle who struck the animal. So some, you know, that feels like it's important, and, and we also have to recognize that despite our best efforts, sometimes the animals do escape. You have to get them back, get them back right away. You don't, you don't, that's like your first priority if it happens. <laughs> so would you need to say something like good faith effort to good keep faith effort animals to keep your animals <laughs> contained. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. Good. Yeah. Just like, for just for clarity, I I, I want to. Say we, we we do have the the running at large section. Yeah, I wondered if it was so, covered elsewhere in the yeah, ordinance think, in the ordinances. I think we're good. We we talked about it last time and and put in the except right. cats yeah. part. <laughs> um, except cats. Well, you so. know the state also does have a law relating to working farm dogs, and those dogs, if they are registered as such with the towns, can be considered at large. We had a working farm dog that we registered with the town of Danville when we were there. We've not registered him as such here because we're not, you know, using him in that way. But hmm. that's something that that's does exist. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I think Laura, so Rosie Kruger, um, Finch Road. I think Laura's provided a really eloquent example that there are real farmers in Montpelier, and it's just something that I really encourage the council to remember in all of your work. Um, downtown is a wonderful place and it's foremost in our minds, um, but there are rural parts of the city and there are not so rural parts of the city where people are engaged in farming practices and I know you all want to encourage that, so I just want to remind you to remember it. Thank you. Okay, further discussion? So just to remind ourselves, it's to set a uh, first public hearing uh, for, this for this new language. Uh, all right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you for coming out, aye. and we'll have it on the agenda for the next, uh, next time. And, uh, oh, yep, okay, I'm going to officially close the public hearing. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. All right, so um, on to Chapter 9, Ordinance Reading. Yep. Thanks, folks. And yeah, and so I'm going to open the public hearing on chapter nine. Okay, are there, um, and I, I know Jack, you have a lot of comments on chapter nine. Um, I also have some thoughts, questions, um, but you go ahead first. Okay, I, um, I mentioned at our, at our last meeting that uh, 
I was interested in the whole idea and concept of licensing, and I uh, had a meeting uh, last week with uh, Lauren Hibbert, who's the uh, head of license, professional licensing at the Secretary of State's office, and uh, it was a very useful conversation. And the way Vermont law looks at licensing is that it's uh, it's an infringement on the ability to carry out a trade or to uh, do some kind of work. And so it really, by statute, has to be justified by uh, some threat to the public health or safety or some, some reason that uh, trades or occupations need to be licensed. And there's a whole process uh, when the legislature is trying to, or is considering licensing where they study the issue, they come up, they generate a report uh, called the Sunrise Report to uh, look at the issues and consider whether licensing should be uh, created. Um, and sometimes, right now, they're in the process of looking at uh, contractors and it's really pretty controversial whether it's going to happen or not. Um, and so I, I looked at that in, in the context of some of the, um, some of the things that we have in the, in the chapter. And so I don't know if we, uh, we could just go through chapter by chapter or section by section and then I could, uh, article by article, I should say, and, and then I could just jump up when uh, when we come to one that I have an issue with. If that's and some and some of the proposals I have are are in the uh, in the packet, but but not everything. Um, that so whatever whatever is your pleasure fine is fine with me. What uh, any other thoughts? I'm taking it sort of, um, uh, I am interpreting that as a section by section, article by article, article, article by article. So. Yeah, fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so it sounds like we should probably do that anyway. Um, does, it, does that sound okay? All right, um, do you have any comments on Article 1? Nope. Any other comments on Article 1? Uh, Lauren. I just have a question that comes up later. So in here it says there's a fee schedule, and then there's still embedded in here several fees that maybe are flagged later, like the shoe shine $5 fee, and taxi cabs have a $35 fee. So I'm wondering if we just want to consistently, as we find them, strike those out and keep those in the fee schedule? I would assume so. Yes. Okay, so we'll try to flag those if I see any. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so having looked through Article 1, any other comments? Okay, Article 2, auctioneers, transient, and transient auctioneers. The proposal is to just uh, delete the requirement for licensure. Uh, auctioneers are licensed by state law, and I think that's why uh, city staff did that. That makes sense to me. Uh, all right, that, then it skips to Article 4. Um, should we be renaming that Article uh, some new article, or does we that? Can really rename them all okay. There. Okay. Fair enough. So, nonetheless, the blacksmith shop. Um, the question I have, and the clerk may know the answer to this, but it occurred to me: if we're going to be licensing blacksmith shops, should we establish uh, standards and criteria for doing it? And like, do we have do we have a form that someone could come in and say, "I want to get a license for a blacksmith shop"? Just a standard form, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think that was talked about being left there before or taken out before, and for whatever reason, I was I was the one suggesting not to because I imagined this future where, you know, rustic blacksmith shops become trendy and one moves downtown and burns the block down. Um, you know, may or may not happen. I don't know. I'm sort of agnostic about all this. But no, they just have the same form that everybody else does. Um, as long as I got the mic, though, I, the only thing I'll plant in your minds about licensing 
um, even if it seems redundant with the state, you might want to consider, and this might not come up at all, that there might be a bad actor who you want to be licensed uh, by the city for the purposes of moving quickly and independently hmm. to revoke that license should there be a threat to public safety, which I think is what licensing, uh, municipal licensing is really about. Is this somebody who could, you know, like a restaurant, they start serving fried rat, you know, uh, tartare or something. You might want to just yank that license right away and not wait for the state process. So it's just something to bear in mind. Fair enough. Yeah, and I'm not proposing to get rid of Article 4 on blacksmith shops because this is clearly something that could affect the public safety, but we might want to think about, well, what standards should there be? And I have a friend who's a blacksmith who's not in the city of Montpelier, but his, his blacksmith shop actually burned down a, uh, about a year or two ago, and so it was, it, it can happen. And so I, I, yeah, oh yeah, I, I volunteer to talk to him about it to see what he might propose for safety standards, but for now I think, yeah, yeah. for now I yeah. think we should just uh, leave it the, where it is. Uh, but, well, part of me, um, you know, coming to Bill's point about it seems obvious that we should be requiring sprinklers in blacksmith shops. Um, one thought I had was, does that belong in the zoning? Because that's sort of a, a use question. But if we have a license that we're requiring of blacksmiths, uh, should uh, it seems obvious to me that we should at least be. You could do it there or in that. the building section, the building code section, which is coming up. Okay, can we, uh, that, that may make more sense, because uh, because that's a building requirement, this could, this is really more about the operation of the business rather than the, the standards for the building. Um, can we just make a note of that for the building code, um, that we are requiring sprinklers <laughs> in blacksmith shops? <laughs> yes, Donna. Did he rebuild, Jack? Yes. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, He's out in Marshfield on Route 2. Uh, very good guy, Stephen Bronstein. He uh, just had his, uh, he was, participates in the Open Studio Weekend, which was just last weekend. He's received national acclaim for his, uh, for his work. OK. Yeah. Next question is, does he have any peers? <laughs> uh, there are other blacksmiths besides Stephen Bronstein around. Oh yeah, no, cool. I, I know at least one other one. <laughs> um, okay. And the shop is still there as of now, as far as I know. Okay, no, fair enough. All right, so um, any other comments on Article 4? Okay, um, moving on to uh, Article 5, formerly known as Bowling Alley's Shooting Galleries and Indoor Skating Rinks. I support the staff proposal to not require licenses for bowling alleys or skating rinks. Shooting galleries seems like something to have licensed. Agreed. Okay, fabulous. Moving on. Um, article 6. Circuses, carnivals, and shows. Not a lot of proposed changes here. Yeah. Okay. Ever, any other comments about uh, Article 6? Okay, great. Uh, moving on to Article 7, dance halls, nightclubs, or dance clubs. I don't have a proposal, but I do raise a question that I haven't gotten and figured out yet, which is what's the public safety, public health or safety concern with licensing these? I think typically it's noise and neighborhood disruption, and so it is one way to deal with. Um, okay. I mean, other places I've worked, that was the main purpose yeah. for having it. Uh, Would no. they not also fall under the building as far as <clears throat> how many, uh, told how many people they're allowed to have inside? Oh, yeah, they would, and they would have to still have meet capacity, you know, fire codes, and they probably, have, you know, they have to meet decibel things and zoning. So that's but in I any other section. I think the issue is just if somebody's really causing, you know, yeah. it's a faster way to get to it than some of those other ways. If they're just not behaving well, then they can have their license yanked and then 
enforce the other stuff. When, when these appear in different places, is there a refer reference to them? Like dance halls, let's say. They, they, they're required to license, but they also have other permits. <laughs> Well, they, they, would come, they would come different ways. So, you know, when you have a club, you know, you, the, the capacity is going to be the same regardless of whether you're dancing or not. So, so mm -hmm. a public place of assembly is just going to have a capacity. Okay. And then a sound ordinance, they, they wouldn't do prospectively. It would only be if they were exceeding it and, and people were complaining. Whereas here they'd come in and say, okay, we are going to have this type of entertainment. Um, you know, I don't know if this if this implies also live music or, or not. Um, it says nightclub. I don't know. You know what that means. So whether some, you know, it's just one way that you could stop the activity, the, the you know, particular activity, if there were bad things going So it's, it isn't as if they're going to be required to have a certain condition of sound um, installation to reduce sound. Well, that might ultimately be a solution to get their license back. Or okay, but that's up to them. It's just the measurement of the sound and the impact to the neighbors. Okay. Right, or the crowds that are assembling or other bad behavior. Uh, Glenn, any further thoughts? Yeah, I guess um, I'm not sure this is going to be articulated well yet, but m my sense is that when one is applying to get one of these licenses, probably not much more is required than a bit of cash and, uh, you know, no obvious gigantic red flags. Insurance. Insurance. <laughs> um, so a lot of it, uh, again, like, you're not going to have to prove that you have sound barriers and so on and all that ahead of time, but then it's the enforcement mechanism. Does that make sense? Is that true? Yes. It sounds right. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else remembers this, but I remember many years ago there was a big controversy up on Berlin Street with uh, the music at the Brown Derby and uh, the neighbors complaining about the music and... Steve MacArthur was on the council at the time, and he had experience playing in bands, and so he got involved in trying to figure out a solution. And it took up a lot of council time for a while. It was really pretty wild. Oh. Um, all right, well, I'm feeling pretty ready to move on from this. Are there any other comments on this one? OK. Uh, on to Article 8. Drive-in theaters. Mm -hmm. Taking it out. <laughs> Fair enough. Any comments on this? Okay, moving on. Uh, Article 9, dry cleaners. Uh, Lauren. Uh, given the chemicals and other things they use, I, I think we should know where they are and we should have a city. I mean, there's the potential health risk that they can pose if we had one. And just and then there's all this like history with contamination of like being able to trace that back and having our own city records it seems they're coming in. So I agree. I know we don't have any right now. true dry cleaners in town operating, but should we ever have one, uh, I would want this record as well, and especially if there are bad actors, um, being able to pull their license would be important, I think. Um, so I would, I mean, it sounds like you're proposing that that we unstrike at least the that first section there, the required license. Yeah, although I'm wondering, I don't know if people still use gasoline and stuff for dry cleaning, so I wonder if you need to be that specific or carry on the business of dry cleaning unless licensed. Seems fair. Maybe, other maybe it needs some further clarification. Okay. All right. Um, saw general nodding to that to that one. Yeah, we'll try to figure out some language there. I mean, I think, you know, if it just said to carry on the business of dry cleaning, well, even what we have now could be called the business of dry cleaning, even though they're not cleaning on premise. So we just have to make sure we're talking about actual cleaning yeah. on premise and not mm -hmm. 
a dry cleaning business that's taking your stuff away. Yep. Okay. Uh, Article 10, gas stations. Uh, Lauren. I might similarly argue they use potential public health risks that we might want our own licensing. Oh, sorry. Um, I might similarly say, knowing that there are public health risks with gasoline stations or contamination issues, we'd want to keep our own track of those, although I don't know what Jack's rationale. Yeah, I, I didn't, this is, didn't come from me. I assume it came from staff because they're all so already reg regulated by the state. Right. That was sort of what was. Thoughts? Good on striking. Um, I guess I'd be curious to uh, entertain a hypothetical. If we did have licensure for gas stations, when might we want to revoke a license here before the state acted? Um, in the potential of uh, just numerous spills, you know, um, they're, they're mostly all down by the river. Um, and, uh, you know, if they're, um, you know, leaks that are not being fixed or um, I can imagine all kinds of uh, things that of bad behavior on the part of gas stations. So I feel like it wouldn't hurt to have city licensure. <coughs> Any other thoughts? On the other Jake. hand, I'm inclined to think that this is an area that the state is going to be on top of if uh, if there are complaints. I don't know that for certain, but that's my belief. John, do you have any opinion? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> have you been licensing them? I sent them out. This was one of those um, that was never, since before I got here, it had been sort of understood to be off, and I was sort of mystified by that. But I did send it out for the first time then this last year. Not everyone was compliant, so this next year I was going to start going medieval on people. But, um, but yeah, I did. I sent out the first wave. I also figured, you know, give them, give them a little time to breathe to get used to it because some of them were clearly confused. But, yeah, um, my plan was phase it in, phase it back in over two years and get hardcore this coming year. I also would not mind um, asking the gas stations in Montpelier to disclose how much gas they're selling. I know that's a, kind of a big thing. Is that part of I'm licensure? Just saying, I'm just saying that out loud. Um, yeah. Maybe I shouldn't be saying that out loud yet, but I'm saying it. Um, because uh, that's this is a part of knowing um, our, our carbon emissions coming from Montpelier. In any case, if we were to ever want to go down that path, having a license would be helpful. So are the emissions actually happening in Montpelier, or is someone just filling up and heading down the... It's, it's a, a part of our... Um, footprint. Part of our footprint. I'd be... I'd, well, that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> we, I'd be shocked if we have the authority to do it. <laughs> I'm sure we don't, but uh, it's an interesting... I think it's, a, and it's an important piece of data. I, but bet, anyway. I bet that information is available. Well, it's, it's it not available by gas station. It's available by distributor. Uh, hmm. And they have regions, and those regions are not coterminous with uh, municipalities or even counties. And what I was thinking was, and maybe it's not, but it might be possible to derive the answer based on information in the possession of the tax department. So I think the, the issue there is that the taxes as the mayor said, the tax is assessed at the distribution level. So that's, it's the distributor pays a, a bulk tax. So, so they pay it to the state and then it goes to the stations and they, they add it on because they've, they've, they've bought so it from the distributor. With the tax in Right, so the station buys it from the distributor, pays the tax to them, so then they charge you the tax. Oh, so, cool. so the tax department doesn't necessarily know what each individual station is selling. They only know what the distributor is selling. So, Perhaps I should not have muddied the waters with that <laughs> spitballing, but um, n nonetheless, uh, I'm still open to um, further comments on this. Um, any other thoughts? I know, Lauren, you had your hand up. Yeah. 
maybe we could send a signal on this by requiring licensure of gasoline stations, but not of electric vehicle charging stations. Ooh. But we don't require license. We, we no. could put we in a put section. That in there, yeah, put, put a section in <laughs> yeah, saying yeah, right. just be explicit. Right. we do not require a license for. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> Exemptions. <laughs> no, I don't know. We might want to know where those are, too, and how many we have of those. Yeah. <laughs> but not charge them a fee. Um, well, yeah, it, ahead, it seems like something that uh, I'm already hearing people say, make enough comments that. We're not going to pass this as final today, most likely. So this might be something to look into before next time. Yeah, fair enough. And uh, so actually on that point, so we would warn potentially a, on another public hearing yeah. on yeah. this. And we can probably, we can talk more about gas stations mm -hmm. later on. Well, we, have, we have to have a second reading anyway, so. Oh, yeah. this is yeah. only the first, the first reading. First. Oh, gosh, OK. Any other comments on the section? Okay. But the agenda says it's the second public hearing. Yeah, we I think yeah. we talked about it. I was gonna say I feel like this is the second time we've talked about it. Sorry. Like, yeah. Boy, okay. I'm really off of my hearings. As, <laughs> as long as we don't vote on it tonight, everyone remember, don't okay. vote. Don't on it. vote. <laughs> <laughs> Word another meeting or another hearing. Okay. Uh, okay. So moving on um, from there, um, Article 11. Go ahead. The uh, there is a proposal of amendment that would uh, include short-term rentals as defined uh, by statute in uh, required licenses for uh, hotels, motels, tourist houses, and so forth. And the short-term rental term in includes essentially Airbnb, VRBO. Um, I think you have to have at least 14 nights of rental to qualify and you know there are standards but but I figured if we're going to be licensing these places we know that uh, or we have good reason to believe that short term rentals are affecting the uh, rental housing market they should be licensed too just so you all know I you know this topic came up a couple times in the last couple years and I did do a little playing around with the Airbnb database to see if I could collect a list to send bills to, um, and I'm pretty confident that I could I could get 90, 95 percent of them with a letter. So okay, that's great. Uh, Donna, is there a way to put? You refer to this um, state statute. Is there a way to put more in there instead of making me go look for it? You said as defined. In the yeah. statute, but you didn't include it. I did. I didn't include it. I. I could. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have it in front of me, but I could get it to you. Do I you would just it? prefer to have, have it, it here, but I know we don't always do that. But well, yeah. So it's really up to the council, of course. But one of the logic of just referring to the statutes is that if the state statute changes, we we don't have to redo our ordinances if we want to. On, on the other side is if mm -hmm. it changes, you know. Then we're, we can still have what we want, even if the state changes it. So, so if it changes, you're saying it'll still keep the same numbers, so the reference wouldn't have to be changed. Usually, well, I'll let the lawyers decide. But even if they change their numbers, it usually the implication is it follows the the new number, right? Is that? That's what I would assume. Yeah, that's always because we we have several references. I know, here. and I just don't like them. <laughs> 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 I like it to be here. I go to this place. I should be able to get all the information here. Well, I'll, I'll get it to you before the next uh, hearing, and then we can decide what to do about yeah, well, it. Thank you. Maybe it's really short. You're welcome. It's not, it's not super short, but it's not super long. Um, maybe this is, uh, so your proposal there um, says, as used in this chapter, the term includes short-term rental as defined in VSA, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, should it, it it's uh, only just a little confusing to me that it's defined there. Maybe you were saying this too, Donna, but maybe, maybe not. Um, should it be 
referenced up in the beginning section, no person shall keep an inn, hotel, motel, tourist house, tourist cabin, or camps, beds, or breakfast establishment, or similar facility providing transient accommodation. I feel like it should be up in that in that section as include, well. Include include or short term rental. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It should be, it should be in that list. Okay. Um, yeah. And yeah. then we can say, and we're we're defining that as per you know this other language, whether we reference it, state statute, or just write write it out. Okay. okay. Um, so hopefully that's that makes sense. Okay. Uh, any other comments on this? Yes. Yeah. When you talked about the short-term rental, I heard like the over 14 days, is there a max? Like if it's over six months and it's not a short-term, over one month or? Um, I don't think so. My recollection is, you know, because it could be 14 months, 14 days rented out to 14 different people or I oh. was, because uh -huh. that's, that's the way these things work or 14 days rented out to seven different people uh, for each for a weekend. Okay, so people who rent out rooms to legislators, well, they would be, be included could be in this. covered by this, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, how does the, wait, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just coming back to that point. How does that, How, how does that not then just apply to any rental apartment that's month to month? It doesn't have a, it doesn't have a max or a confinement of this short or this long. Yeah, like if it applies, I mean, because I, I, I tend to think of, like when the legislators come here, they're just renting a space. They're just renting a room, um, potentially. And that's just, that's a regular, that can be a regular month to month kind of lease, but that's not what we're talking about here, right? Okay, right, I'm, I'm looking it up. Could somebody read me the, uh, the statutory site? I, I found it, oh, okay. um, Lauren. So short term rental means a furnished house, condominium, or other dwelling room or self-contained dwelling unit rented to the transient traveling or vacationing public for a period of fewer than 30 consecutive days and for more than 14 days per calendar year. Okay. Fewer than 30 consecutive. Okay. Consecutive, yeah, so that's okay. Yeah, so that. Legislators would not fall yeah. under Right, and that the month to month would month then month not month right. um, qualify. Okay, I great. Can, I can email that. I can email that to everyone since I have it here. Super, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> All right, any further comments on this section? Okay, moving on. Um, section 13, junkyards. I have a proposal for that that I that did not get into the packet because I was getting it out to Jamie kind of late, but I have copies for everyone. Okay. And um, while I checking on this, I checked with uh, with Mike Miller and Meredith Crandall, and they agreed that. Uh, the way the current zoning ordinance is written, there is no place in Montpelier that you would be allowed to have a junkyard or salvage yard. And so the proposal of amendment is to, one, change junkyard to salvage yard because that's a statutory term. And then the second section, a person shall not operate, establish, or maintain a salvage yard in the city of Montpelier. Period. period. <laughs> and no everything license. else is just out here. Yeah. Sounds okay to me. <laughs> cool. Okay. Guys, yeah, Lauren. I guess my only question is does it belong in the licensure ordinance then if we're prohibiting? Is that normal? Yeah. That's, that's a valid question. I think we should also check and see whether um, whether we are allowed to blanketly prohibit them. There may be, I think there's been, been wars fought over that in other places. Um, it's just a quick call to the Municipal Association to the League, but um, 
there are certain things that are difficult to be, you know, constitutional. You can't say, you can zone them and you can put them in certain places. You can have certain requirements or screening, but you can't necessarily say you can't have them. Um, I think, you know, uh, mobile homes are another example of that. Yep. People used to try to ban them and you're not allowed to. You can put certain regulations around them. So I think we just we might want to check this. So you'll do that? Yep. Thanks. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, yes, uh, it, because it's a little odd to put something in here you're not licensing. I think you'd want to put it somewhere so, else if you're disallowing something. Okay. Everything else is what we're licensing, right? Mm -hmm. hmm. I mean, if they're just blanketly not permitted in the zoning, does that cover it? Maybe. I don't know. In that case, we maybe we just delete this article rather thing. than something else. But, but we can determine that next time. Yeah. Open to suggestions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, moving on. Um, 14, vendors. Any other comments on this? Staff suggestions seem uh, good to me. Uh, Donna? Um, John, have you had any particular problems? Because this is a very active one that you would want to share with us? No, people are pretty good about it, even when I have to tell them no. Um, it's, it's gone very smoothly. I have you know, good relationships with the folks who, who are out there, so it's all good. Glenn. Are there a limited number of vending uh, licenses available? Ad administratively, there's a limited number of spots that have been approved, but you know there's wiggle room in there to find more if appropriate and that kind of thing under the under the rules. And that's that hasn't ever happened. I mean, we sort of experimented with that once, and it sort of didn't work out. So we just generally just been the spots that are. Sort of administratively pre approved. This uh, this came up. There is a little history to this. A few years ago, now I can't remember the exact year. Um, there was a proliferation of downtown vendors, and they were sort of here and there and everywhere, and you know, obstructing sidewalks. And we started getting some pushback from the the local businesses saying, "Hey, you know, we've got to pay rent. We have a building. You know, this is a competition." And so we had, a, I think, a pretty extensive process that we included merchants and vendors, and we came up with this plan which said, all right, let's find places where there's room on the sidewalk, where people can do these things, and we identified locations and said, basically, we'll issue permits in those <coughs> locations with these criteria. And it's really worked, I think, pretty successfully since we haven't had any complaints from any uh, the vendors or the, the the business, the regular year-round businesses since then. So, yeah, really and, and it, 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 the number dropped after that anyway. So it sort of stopped becoming an issue, and it just became who who gets which space. And John kindly took it over for the manager's office once he came on board, and it's just really worked slick since then. They've done a great job with it. So, <laughs> great, uh, Glenn and uh, Lauren. And forgive me if this is somewhere in here that I I haven't managed to find it, but. How does this interact with the farmer's market? Is that under the, the special event license? Is that just a blanket? You know, that's that sort of thing has come up, or um, it's come up, you know, possible conflict with, like, um, Independence Day. Um, I've always really dug in, and there was a, a bit of a discussion in one of the councils a few years ago where this seemed to stand of, you know, these folks in good faith have paid for this spot. So when the farmer's market was talking about being moved, you know, I spoke up and said, okay, but remember there are people here who've paid for their spots and that has to be respected. And that always, that seems to work and it seems to have been fine. Um, there are a couple potential spots that get used off and on. One of them's in use now um, on the non-food spots on the Rialto Bridge there. Um, those are the ones that might come close enough to conflicting, but. I've never heard about a problem there. You know, there's um, the, oh, what's her name? Down there on the corner, who's always there? Selling oh. the bowls. 
Um, well, there's Darla Morissette. Yes, yes, thank you. And you know, so she's always there, and it's just never been conflict. She's she's not part of that. She's a vendor. Um, yeah, so I always dig in on their behalf, and so far I've won. So works for me. And we have a <laughs> lease with the farmers market for the for the land. So we, we I don't think we've charged them a vendor license too. I'm not sure if we do. Do we the farmers market? Farmers market. Yeah. Do they pay one vendor license for the whole thing? That's all done through there. That's through the lease. That's not my, not my department. Right, but it's through, it's yeah because we have a lease with them. That, that was kind of my question because it seems reading the language like you could read it to mean that every individual farmer's market booth needs a license like this. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, right. And I don't think that that's the intent and I don't, I'm not sure that it makes sense. No, and I think, I, I, I remember we've had this discussion before and I think if anything we just charged one license to the entire farmer's market but we also leased them the space and so I think it was in, included in the lease was there, one license. So. Oh, uh, Lauren? Yeah. Um, just a minor thing in section nine of this, so it's page six of this article. Um, this is one where you've got a specific fee listed, the last se um, sentence. So I don't know if we want to remove that. The weekend so only license? Under weekend yeah. only license, it has oh, yeah. a license fee of $100 yeah. specified. Yep, thank you. Don? So uh, I may have not read it all the way through at one sitting, but the renewal is marked out. I don't understand that. Is it somewhere else that I just not connect the dots? Uh, 91409 renewals, it's oh. all marked out. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's not a big crowd and it's never been an issue. People will, you know, will renew well in advance of that if, because um, they're traditionally sort of given dibs on the next spot. So. That just is a, a very narrow time to insist on payment, but I felt Do you like. not want anything about renewals in here? I, I understand it might be why this language shouldn't work. But I, don't, I don't see why. I don't think it's necessary. So if I yeah. want to renew something, how do I know? I you just, just come to, to me and say, I want to do it again. So you okay. just follow the getting. I'm, like, I'm, yeah. You just go back to, to what yeah. you did to do it initially. Yeah, okay. I make them fill out a new form every year. Okay. So that's about it. Makes sense. Well, check. except uh, following up on that, if uh, if there's no provision for renewal, then then does that mean that the uh, license exists in perpetuity or until it's uh, uh, terminated by some action? It's, you know, there's a period. I'm not sure if this is written out in the ordinances or in the administrative, but it's a period of, uh, of a year for yeah, licenses. Yeah, so all the way up at 9-2, duration of licenses, which I think covers all of them, first day of April. Yeah, there you go. So maybe it's taken out because that Article 2 covers everything. I think that's right. Okay. Any further comments on this one, this section? Okay. All right. Uh, Article 16, rendering plant. I think we had asked about this last time. Um, well, maybe we didn't. Uh, I, I wasn't sure why this existed. I, I'm not sure what all is involved in a rendering plant. Really bad smells, I think. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, really bad smells. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I would well, just then keep maybe it. Maybe we should keep yeah. it. Uh, Lauren? Uh, and after we find out the information about salvage yards, this say we could mirror this language no license shall be granted to a salvage yard. And then it would. F Apparently, we do prohibit things in here. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are some things you can prohibit. I'm just not sure about salvage yards. Yeah, yeah. So if we find that answer and decide yeah. we want to. Yeah, I've already sent, I've already sent yeah. the question. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay, great. Further comments? Okay, moving on to 17. Restaurants, lunchrooms, snack shops, other food establishments. 
Uh, Jack? I had a proposal. I put together a proposal to just delete this entire thing. John says, well, there's a reason to keep it. Um, I don't know what other people think. I guess I'm, I'm not going to push it if people think that uh, it makes sense to keep it. Is it. What's your logic there? It's a policy question. I can just you know, Im imagine an immediate health need or concern that, um, you know, that the city might want to have an emergency meeting and put the brakes on them. Um, a lot goes on in restaurants, but, you know, it's a policy question, so. It's the, the serving rat example. Right, the serving rat example, mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, the mind boggles, the sort of a train wreck of weird, you know, restaurant things that could happen, and um, it just may be something the city might want to be able to move more nimbly on, or not. Um, Donna, were you going to see Well, I was just thinking, I think it'd be useful to know where all the restaurants pop up. Sometimes they're pretty small, and, and so it puts the city on alert, I guess, to me. And it does, it does give us a more instantaneous uh, response to any situation. So I sort of like it, but maybe it's just comfort level. Are people complying with this presently? Yeah, I have to track some of them down if there's a new one and such. But, yeah. but they, but they, they do. Yeah, okay. yeah, I get no licenses. Okay. Uh, Connor, just a question: Is the state exempt from these licenses? So if there's a canteen in a state office building, or the Abbey Group cafeteria in the state house? You know, there was one time I I thought I should go and send them a license request, and there was some reason I talked myself out of it, and I can't remember what that could have been. Um, so I'm going to respond with a big blank look. Having worked in a couple of restaurants, I think <coughs> I uh, am with Jack on this. I remember, you know, the health inspectors coming and <coughs> checking pretty thoroughly on, on a pretty regular basis. And um, I, I don't think I would mind having city licenses, but I, I don't feel that it's terribly necessary. It can make a lot of people very happy if you got rid of it. I will tell you that, that a lot of people see like, it as a I like making people happy. thing. Well, well I, I, st I still then will propose deleting this uh, <coughs> article in its entirety. Other thoughts? Show of hands. It's okay. Erase it. I, I don't have strong feelings about it. It's like people. Gone. Go sure. Ahead. Sure. Gone. That's. You can always put it back. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Fair enough. Okay. With another public hearing. <laughs> okay. Uh, shoe shining. My proposal is to get rid of it. You're here. Is there a reason why we would need it? I cannot imagine a public health or safety uh, reason for doing this. And, and I, can, I can certainly imagine that uh, it might have been established at a time where it was intended to uh, discriminate against uh, certain uh, racial or ethnic groups who are more likely to engage in this profession. I guess I was thinking, so first of all, I don't have any issue with getting rid of it. I think, so you, you went to a darker place than I did. I, I <laughs> was thinking that it just may be to make sure someone's not in the middle of a sidewalk obstructing, you know, do you have permission to be here? Do you have a license? You know, are you in a proper location to do such a thing? That was. Well, but that wouldn't it be a vendor then? I mean, a vendor, yeah. I mean, well, that, if, they're, if they're setting up a place for people to sit and. Right. Etc. It's a vendor going to right. a vendor license. I've, that solved. that makes sense to me, but I wonder if I just want to go back and check to see because um, a vendor might be selling a product, and this would be a service. Uh, uh, but but actually, it does say uh, vendor shall be any person, um, including um, uh, someone who sells or offers etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, personal services, and I think 
that could be considered massages, um, personal whatever. services. So, yeah. um, okay, so getting rid of it then. Sure. All right. Okay, great. Okay, on to uh, 19, taxi cabs. You've got my proposal of amendment. It's basically uh, parallel to the uh, to the Airbnb issue, and that uh, is a proposal to treat uh, uh, app dispatched uh, vehicles like Lyft and Uber the same way other taxi cabs are treated. Just to give you all some background on that, um, that was the issue. <laughs> it was very entertaining. I shouldn't go into too much detail. But it was a little bit of a surprise when, to me when it was announced that Uber was here in this room. Hmm. Um, so this was an attempt to craft an ordinance that could be inclusive of, of Uber and Lyft. I don't think Lyft is here yet, but, but Uber is theoretically. So since you, know, you can't get them to you know, give us all your drivers and stuff like that to just license the service itself, now, having said that, you know, I've sent them a couple letters that have gone into oblivion looking for my $35, so I'm not sure how to enforce it. But that was the idea to sort of accommodate um, those services under this. And in fact, there was a, a, a much longer taxi cab ordinance, uh, licensing with all sorts of requirements, and, and it was including, you know, requiring criminal screening of cab drivers and all that stuff, and it was all taken out. Um, to, to this, with the attempt to, to create parity between cab companies and Uber. So anything that further does that would be great. Okay. Uh, Lauren? Um, thanks, I think this helps uh, with that issue. The other one I was not, I don't think this yet addresses was the, like we're doing this trial of micro transit. Um, so this would require that to get a license, which I don't think it should need to, or I mean, maybe we do think it is. I just don't think it's like a taxi cab, or let's just be explicit if that's the policy decision we want, is that that service, if it's even if it's run by GMTA or something, that they have to come in and get a city license to but, do that. But the definition says, and not by direct communication. They will have some direct communication with the operator. Theory, the buses now are, are vehicles that are used right. for transporting people. Let's just say that, right, GMTA should fall under this, according no. to this definition. Yeah, that probably would be the simplest way. But, right, so if we exempt public transport um, or public options, that okay. would probably, that w I think that would make sense. Okay. Does that, does that work? Um, maybe this is, uh, I don't want to muddy this too much, but does it make sense to license the vehicle or to license the company um, that provides the vehicles? Just again, with that conversation, it, it was felt that it was, it was just unrealistic to license <laughs> Uber vehicles since they can come and go. Um, and the, I mean, the, the drivers can opt in, opt out any given time, and there was just no practical way to track that, which is why it shifted to one fee for you know, per company, essentially. My only question then is, uh, how does that, how is that reflected then in that, that first sentence, no person, firm, or corporation shall operate a taxi cab until a license has been obtained? So, um, they, by since we identify like no person shall do that, does that muddy it? Like, what if we just said no firm or corporation shall operate the taxi cab? That's what section one says. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, no person firm. Yeah, no person. So I'm I'm suggesting that we take out the word person so that it's not confusing. That like we're we're charging Uber or we're charging. So I just. Yep. So now I'm just playing devil's advocate. Okay. So I just put a little cab license, up, you know, thing on my car. I start riding around, and I don't. I'm a single person. I'm not a firm or a corporation. And I just start. Hmm. Yeah. <coughs> and I, you know, well, maybe it makes sense to keep it. Maybe and we don't need to regulate them at all. Because <laughs> you know, we used to regulate rates and everything. 
and now we don't. So, I mean, it's a little. Uh, you know, I would just, again, just sort of guy who has this, deals with this sort of thing. Um, you know, there was that issue with, not too long ago, with a, a problem in Barrie with one of their drivers. And that was a concern when we changed this, was backing off from the individual drivers, mm -hmm. which was sort of, eh, all right, maybe that's sketchy, maybe that could be a problem. But at the very least, if there's a problem with the driver, it seems like we should be able to you know, revoke a license of a company until they get their act together and get more responsible drivers. So I would strongly advocate for keeping some type of taxi license. Even if it's at the person, the person level? I mean, I, I would lean towards that. Okay. Um, yeah. That's fine. Mm -hmm. That works. I don't feel as strongly about that. Just the existence of a license at all, I think, is probably important. Um, I do also want to note uh, there's a license fee in here. I um, wonder if we should um, edit that to, be, to reference a schedule. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, I'm a little confused because it, are we saying company or person? Or just person. It seems like you need company in there if you're going to be it's, it's a, it's licensing same, Uber. It says so no person, both. firm, or corporation. Okay, so, so you're keeping any all of, of it. them. So we're just keeping all of it. Good. <laughs> Unless there's any objection to that. Okay. Any further comments on this section? Uh, Connor. Isn't there a non discrimination language we can reference in statute like you did before? Because that's sort of always changing as well. Well, we have dis you saw that we have non-discrimination language in the right, ordinance right, already. Right. I thought there was a statutory reference that we've used in other places. Hmm. Could be wrong. You'd like to reference like the Vermont State? Why don't I look it up in the meantime? Okay. It could be in the Fair Housing and Public Combinations Act. Okay. okay. Would, you name, <coughs> yeah. would you name these and then add it? The reference to the statute? Maybe, because I would think we'd want to be consistent with the okay. state law on this. Yeah, fair. Any other comments? Okay, moving on to 20 theaters and stage shows. On this, I actually emailed some. Uh, uh, labor and industry, I think, uh, fire safety to see what uh, if they have any thoughts about what what their standards are, if they have standards for capacity, egress, and that kind of thing. Um, and I didn't hear back, so I'm not proposing anything. But I suspect that theaters have those requirements because I know upstairs we uh, hear Kathleen say uh, at the beginning of every show, "Tell us." Uh, where the exits are, because they are the entrances. Um, but so, I don't know whether we need it, but I'm not proposed, uh, without knowing more, I'm not proposing to change it. Seems fair. Other thoughts? Okay, uh, moving on. Um, so we have this deleted, or proposed deleted section 21, trailer parks. Thoughts on that? Sorry? Deleted. As deleted. Yeah. yeah. Um, sounds good. And I think that is the end. Um, Jack. Jack. No, I, I, I should just. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, I should just point out that uh, this is, uh, there's a difference between uh, a trailer park uh, as defined here and what many of us would uh, characterize as a trailer park, which is defined in the Vermont statutes in Title 10 as a mobile home park. And this is really it. And I don't think you can, a town can prohibit a mobile home park. But this is a place where people tow their trailer for vacation and drag it away with them when they leave. But we're not outlawing mobile home parks. Not that they exist in my theory. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, yes. 
I move that we uh, schedule a, another public hearing uh, number to be determined, but I think it's third to uh, I incorporating all the amendments that we've uh, made tonight. Is there a second? Second. Um, any public comment? Would you like to make a comment, Steve? <laughs> Steve. Steve, Steve. Steve. Any public comment? Any public comment? No. Okay. Great. All right. So I'm going to officially close the public hearing, by the way. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Wonderful. Thank you for your indulgence. Yes. Um, I'm so glad you all are doing that. Yeah. Well, I also just want to note um, that chapters 10 and 11 are relatively, I mean, chapter 9 was the longest, uh, but 10 and 11 are also relatively long, and we may just want to pace one? ourselves, yeah, with that. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that? And well, and especially because we're, we have, reviewing other stuff. we're reviewing other stuff, so maybe we just don't take on 10 and 11 until we're done with 8, and, eight and 9. Um, yes, I'll let you know, both Complete Streets and the Transportation Infrastructure Committee have a, a lot of comments. And okay. they have taken the broad stroke of putting together all mobile devices, whether it's e-scooters, bikes, skateboards. I mean, the pebble. very comprehensive. So okay. you're going to need some time. And it, it may make sense to just even spend one um, meeting on just that section. You know what I mean? Yeah, and they yeah. would appreciate knowing when we think we'll get to it. Okay. So why don't we do next meeting we've got the amendment on our on eight, eight and then this last week on nine. So we'll just do those and then um, just do 10. And then when 10 is done, we'll complete 11. So yes. Like, yep. So it'll be like two meetings for mm -hmm. 10 and two meetings for 11. That sounds great. Great. Okie dokie. All right. So uh, we <laughs> are done with, done with nine for now. Um, we, we did just vote, right? Uh -huh. just, just now, just remember that. Okay, we did just vote. All right, on to the last topic for the night, and we've got 20 minutes if we're going to get out of here by 10, um, tax stabilization policy. Or we could take it up another time, because there's nobody's <laughs> otherwise hanging out here. But we could do it now. That would be okay, too. So I will say before we, well, if, first of all, decide what you want to do. You, should we do it now? Are you feeling um, okay? I'm... In deciding that, I'm curious, uh, Bill, has Ashley had any comments on the? She, so as, as you know, we sent, I sent it out twice to the committee and I heard from people and she did not, she did not comment. I, I did say, you know, it's, you don't have to comment if you're okay with it. So, um, but I have not heard from, from her. Um, what I was going to say is if we, if we do it, I, it, I want to be clear, this is not, to, to be adopted tonight, we have three definitions we need to talk about and some of the things, but I, I think so all, all, at least I was looking for is, are we close? Like, are we going in the right direction? Is this where we're headed policy-wise um, before we, can I, you know, I don't know whether we want to reconvene our committee for those definitions or other people want to work on those. Um, and then there is still the open question on TIF, which I can report a little bit on, although it's not definitive. Done. I think Ashley has made us really clear she does not support any tax stabilization. So it isn't a matter of her editing this. I think she's been really clear this is not an option that I've ever heard her support. So I don't think she'll miss our discussion. I think she'll come in very firm where she's been that this is not a tool she likes. Well, knowing that we're not voting on it tonight, do you feel okay about having a discussion? Or ten minutes worth? Yeah. Okay. Ten minutes worth. Okay. Uh, all right. So in light of that, um, do I, I assume people have read it? Um, so we don't necessarily need to go through it or introduce it section by section. Nope. Um, any comments or questions about it? I have a couple suggestions. Um, so uh, in in the, I actually got to get to it, in the, because the, the most current is the sp um, fall. fall draft. Fall. Right. Uh, right, okay, so the fall draft. 
there's uh, the yellow highlighted sections mm -hmm. about um, energy efficiency standards um, that need to be defined. Um, one possibility is that um, that could skipping around to too many things here. Uh, it could be um, if the building meets um, LEED certification, if it meets um, Passive House uh, certification, uh, a third would be um, something called uh, a net zero certification as defined by living the Living Building Institute. Um, and so all all of those came to me through um, person who does um, construction work. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. So, yep. So we are talking about. Uh, it is on page five at the very top. So it's the the last page. It's the section um, numbers five, for, six, and seven at the very top. Yep. Criteria for additional years. Uh, yep. Five, six, and seven. It says need to define. Um, so that's those are um, three suggestions. Um, there may be a fourth that I. When can you say lead, do you mean any lead, not necessarily like lead platinum or? Right. I think any lead um, so certification. What were they in lead? So lead, passive house uh, certification, uh, or net zero as defined by uh, the Living Buildings. Living Building Institute. Okay. That's one place to start. And then another suggestion I have um, regarding seven uh, is so with environmental improvements, stormwater, solar, et cetera. Um, I, you know, especially in that this section pertains to uh, private development, uh, there's a lot of uh, suggestions that we have in the stormwater master plan for private property. So, um, which I'm sure, while our zoning would require some stormwater development, it may not particularly identify projects from the stormwater master plan. And so, if we could reference here, um, completion of stormwater master plan identified projects, um, I think that would be a good place to start. Um, yeah, that's all. Th those are all my suggestions. And I think, uh, so on the environmental, so that's, a, that's a great suggestion. I mean, I think that was the thought was, I mean, remember we had the discussion with one of the applicants about where they're going to put solar panels in, and they said, well, you know, we'll make it solar ready. And the thought was, if we're going to grant it, if this was a criteria for an additional year, then it's for something above and beyond what they might normally do. And so it could be, you know, right, it could be something that they don't have to do for their site, but maybe it means putting in a, retention pond or a, or, or a rain garden or something, you know, a green roof or something that, that they're not required, but they're doing extra. And so we want to reward them for that or create an incentive for that. And so I, I just, I don't know that we need to define all these tonight, but I do, they need to be fleshed out. That's all. We're not ready to adopt this policy because we don't have those all in there. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 historic preservation, it was actually raised by former council member Kruger, was if somebody went to an exceptional, you know, something beyond what they did, that, that you know, that could also be a source of a reward. And one thing actually we forgot, I didn't put in here, but we had talked about also was if they, if there was some accommodation for public art, even if they didn't add it, but if it was just provided, you know, place for it. So mm -hmm. um, maybe that could be historic preservation or public art. Mm -hmm. if it's a brand new building. That would make sense. Wasn't there also something about public access? It came up at the timber homes, public access to the river, having I a path. I think that may already be in. Is it there? I missed it. Under one, it's one of the choices under item one. The can number you, in here is Yeah, can you tell me a page easy. number? Or so or just the page four, right, right be okay. below. Oops. So, so, so there's 1A, 1B, and 1C. You can do one of those three to get an additional year. And one of them is, so deed the city certain rights in real property, including easements for riverfront, walkways, parks, okay. et cetera. So that's one way you can do this. Yeah, and, and actually, the uh, I thought 
I was surprised when, when you said that you had forgotten the, the public art element because I think that that is in there. Oh, arts master plan. There it right. is. In, yes. in 1C. So I didn't forget it. Boy, I'm forgetting everything tonight. <laughs> Okay. So, what are your next steps with this? So, I think that so so our next steps would be I think someone, and I don't know whether again whether our committee wants to take a stab at this or, or maybe we'll just write something up and send it around. Those three things need to be defined. I think the if if people are generally happy with the structure and the the policy layout, I think that we'd like to know that. And I think the other issue, and I don't know what we can do about it tonight necessarily, but it does have to do with the TIF. So I can report what I've known. I've actually heard from four different, um, what I would consider well-informed uh, sources, uh, four different opinions of what you can do in, in, in the tax stabilization of the TIF district. So the most conservative is what I drafted, which is if it's in the TIF district, you can't have tax stabilization, period, because you know we want increment to go into the TIF then another, a second version, which I heard from, these were all from different people, was, well, you can do it, but the city has to make up the difference. So you give this one property, then every, the rest has to make up that difference into the, the TIF fund. The third was, you can do it as if, if they are not using any TIF money. So somebody is not getting a public improvement, they're just building, you know, they're downtown, they have all the water and sewer they need, they're just building a new building, they need tax stabilization. They're not taking from the TIF fund so they can do it. And a fourth is, um, which I think is what the city of Barrie has, which is they just allow it and do it and there's no other requirement. So I talked with um, Megan Sullivan, who's the director of VEPSI, about this. And she said there is no, there's nothing in statute that says you can't do it. There's no reference to tax stabilization in the TIF statute. So there, there's no interaction. So she kind of said, well, you could do really any of these. However, she did raise the caution that given the scrutiny that the auditor is under, that it's, it's not unlikely that the auditor could conclude that the city was supposed to have put 100% of its, of its revenue into the TIF district, and by foregoing some of it, you know, they failed to meet their obligations. Again, there's nothing that says you can't do that, but it could be one of those things that when we have an audit in five years, they could say, well, you know, you, you, didn't, you, you exempted this money, so the city has to pay that back into the fund. Um, but she didn't, she was going to try to get me something more definitive, talk to their agency's attorneys by tonight, I've heard them. So I would say that's an open question. The interesting thing about it is our prior policy for tax stabilization encouraged, you know, we gave points or whatever for development in the designated downtown in the growth center. That's where we wanted development to happen. So we're trying to create incentives. If we exempt, if we exempt the TIF district, was, which is essentially the designated downtown of the growth center, we're only providing incentives for those areas outside of that. So, and 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 you know, I think there's certainly a strong argument that could be projects that need that need both. You know, Caledonia Spears is a great example. We had to we had to do some. We didn't have a formal TIF, but we basically did it like a TIF. We provided public infrastructure to be repaid through their their tax payments, as well as giving them tax stabilization. Um, and I don't think, I, I'm certain, having worked with them, so they could not have done their project without both of those things. But now it's here, it's a benefit, it's, you know, and, and I think most people consider it a good addition to the community. Um, so I, I just leave it at that. It's, a, it's to be determined, it's a policy question. We'll hopefully by the time we have an actual proposal, we'll have more clarity on this, but I wanted to make sure that you were all thinking I feel a little torn about that, um, just so um, you all know. I mean, on the one hand, I um, don't want to do anything to upset the auditor. Um, on the other hand, uh, TIF is specifically for to, to go towards public infrastructure to enable um, private development, and this is about the taxation of private development. Um, so it feels to me like two different things, um, and for that reason, I feel torn. Um, and who knows, you know, it'll so. be the same auditor in five years, right? I mean, now, it, it, you know, it does seem like, yeah, probably will, but who knows? It, it, it's kind of a political hot potato with this issue right now, the present auditor. It's not based in statute anymore. 
So anyway, those are the issues. If, um, if people are generally okay with the structure, we'll work on those definitions, try to get some more TIF clarification and bring it back for, you know, actual adoption. Okay, further questions? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Um, skiing those times I just, um, I just want to ask, is there, is there not other examples, other towns or cities that have this dilemma that you're looking at now, you know, this, this co potential conflict between TIF and, and, and tax well, stabilization? So we, well, Barry City has, has both a TIF district and tax stabilization. Um, they're the most local, but they, their TIF was approved under the old TIF rules, and, and there's just a new set of new TIF rules that are coming in. We were one of the first to be approved under the new set of TIF rules, so it's not clear whether it's different criteria. So we're trying to get clarification. I mean, I, I would like to get some kind of okay or at least clear message from the state about how they want to handle this. And, you know, as I said, their, their answer was there is no regulation about it. There's no statute. There's nothing, you know, it's, in one hand, you could do what you want, but the, their expressed concern was in five, we have to get an audit every five years on the TIF district. So in five years when you have your first audit, it's possible that the state auditor who, who does not actually make the TIF rules, because they could offer an opinion that you owe the money, but it's ultimately up to VEPSI to determine whether or not you actually do. So it, it, it's just, I think the concern is just there's a lot of political um, attention on this issue right now, and we want to just try to throw out the baby with the bathwater. So, um, Further comments? We don't need a motion. Oh, no. Lauren. Um, I, I generally like the idea of the criteria for additional years. I think that's an improvement. I mean, to be frank, I, I'm not a huge fan of this tool in general, um, but if we're going to have a policy, I think this is better than what we have on the books right now. Um, I, I know that it's a struggle to try to figure out, like, it's extreme, you have found it extremely difficult to have people demonstrate that they couldn't build the project without it. And so I understand the impetus for pulling that out. Even just having to go through that exercise, though, of trying to say with a straight face that you couldn't do it, I'm like, I just, the idea of giving this to a wealthy developer that is going to develop there anyway and would has plenty of money is, does not seem like a good use of taxpayer dollars. And there's nothing in here that would even get at them having to try to make a case to us that they need this in order to do the development. So I don't know if there's even, I don't know if there's any nod to that that we could add of like, you know, at least have that be part of your pitch to us that we have to like <laughs> believe you enough that we would want to spend limited taxpayer dollars on it. So yeah, I, I understood the operate, you know, that it was a hard thing. So, I, but. Right. I mean, it's a small, it can be a relatively small sum of money in the scheme of a major project. But yeah. I think, you know, uh, maybe just some demonstration of how the, the financial need for this project. I do think we have to be careful, um, you know, I, because a developer is wealthy doesn't necessarily mean, like, they're, each project is going to pencil out on its own. They're not going to, typically, they're not putting their own money into these projects. They're getting financing and they're, you know, it's based on lease revenues and those kinds of things. I mean, they might be putting their 10% in or whatever, so whatever risk they're assuming. So I think the question is, how does, how does, Maybe that's what they we could ask is sort of how does this tax benefit make this project work? And what we've heard from most of the larger projects is that it actually helps the most with what they're able to charge in leases at the, the back end because the leases typically have the tax in it. So it makes it more attractive to lease up, which then makes the, the investment more secure for the banks and everything else. It's not, that, you know, if you think about it, if someone's saving ten thousand dollars a year in property taxes, let's say over over a ten year period, it's a hundred thousand dollars, and they're building you know a couple of million dollar building. It's not, it's kind of a rounding error almost in terms of the cost of the project. But that ten thousand dollars a year for on, on the lease for the tenant could make a big difference. So, uh, Jack. Another thing worth pointing out, and I didn't support a previous. Uh, tax stabilization application because the applicant said, well, we were going to do this even if we don't get it. And so I thought they just didn't meet the standard. But, but one consideration is that the way it's 
it's structured and been structured, you have to apply for tax stabilization after you have your permits. So uh, by that time, the person's pretty much into it, and it's not like they're going to have spent uh, thousands of dollars in getting permits and then back out because they don't get this. So uh, they, I don't think they can make the argument with a straight face, and that's one of the reasons the committee decided that it didn't make sense to keep that requirement in there. Further comments on that? Okay. Great. Thank you. And I, I appreciate <coughs> the, the timing of it, and um, I, I mean, it makes sense to me as well. <coughs> All right. Um, and you don't need a motion. Great, so moving on then. Um, council reports. Um, Donna, you have for starting? Some of you may be interested to know that there is a, a dam safety workshop. And this is about dams that hold water, uh, not a dam workshop, okay? Nope, no <laughs> <dam>. <laughs> not another dam. And it's November 5th. <laughs> and uh, I'm on the email through my Clean Water Committee, but I'm going just to talk about dams, what their purpose is, but it also talks about looking at removal of dams because I mean, we do have other dams besides this one and I don't understand what the whole impact would be of taking that one away or what the other ones do. So if you're interested, let me know and I can sign you up too. Uh, the, the town meeting of the, the league was very good. There was a huge discussion about self-governance and so it's really on town's mind of the state somewhat interfering with base things that they feel are town rights and that towns should deal with, and whether that's uh, zoning or other uh, elements. But anyway, it was a good one, and I'm gonna go back, and, and I missed part of that so that I'm gonna get someone else's notes. Um, but I think it was a good discussion, and from that, we also had a workshop on marijuana. And there's a lot more detailed now of the state having to decide whether towns get to opt in or opt out of having marijuana retail in your town. But it's also the aspect of manufacturing, growing, all of it. It's very complicated. So Carl- And taxation. And taxation. And whether that tax goes to the town and, or how, what percentage the town gets from the state. I mean, it's- a lot of details. Carl Etner from East Montpelier um, would like to have a regional committee, and I volunteer to be on it, and others may be, but to talk about it for all of us to deal with this more collectively than just each individual town deciding. So that's going on. If you have any interest, let me know. And then we've had a complaint in District 1 about barking dog. And this barking dog does not me, uh, meet the criteria of the ordinance that says it has to bark for a continuous period of 20 minutes before it's considered a nuisance. And they've timed this dog again and again. But what this dog is, an example of, is chronic persistent behavior throughout the day, day after day after day. So I'm gonna be bringing forth a potential amendment that hopefully may appear maybe at our next council meeting at the end of the month. But heads up, it's just to help the neighbors deal with something that doesn't quite meet the criteria. And without it meeting the criteria, the, the offending dog owners do not have to participate in mediation. They've invited them, but there's no way to force them without it truly being classified as a nuisance. So uh, Bill may have more to say about that, but I just wanted to give you a heads up Sorry, it's about dogs. It's okay. <laughs> no worries. All right. Um, they promised the Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife they would publicize his potluck game dinner on October 16th. <laughs> and it's uh, 5.30 to 8.30 in the garage space in Montpelier. I'm a vegetarian, so mm -hmm. I'm beating the deer, bear, squirrels. Um, the serving there. Um, but yeah, probably worth checking out. Uh, personal note, I've been on medical leave, so I apologize if it's uh, been tough to get a hold of me lately. Um, just been out of commission a couple days there. The good news is if you have a seizure, they take away your driver's license for three months. So I've gotten really accustomed to cycling around on my Schwinn 
Mm -hmm. I apologize to Glenn for voting against the bike lane study a couple of meetings ago. So let's, let's help my perspective around that. On that. So that's, that's good news. That's it for me. Um, yeah, life without a car is great. I, I hate biking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to admit, I prefer walking too. But um, so. Uh, as may be apparent, um, the Homelessness Task Force is uh, energetic and uh, um, high-tempered. Um, and, um, and the meetings are going really well, I think. Um, I hope that they continue to go well. And I'm, I'm, um, I'm trying to think of the right adjective. It's not exactly that I'm pleased to be serving the city, but I am. I am I'm I'm with it. I'm I'm trying to get there every time. I didn't. I, I missed one because I was sick. Um, on Monday, uh, the homelessness task force uh, did ask me to bring to the council uh, tonight uh, their uh, urgent request that we try to figure out how to get the city hall bathrooms open 24 hours a day. Um, didn't seem like something to, to uh, throw into the previous conversation about the warming shelter, um, but I do need to uh, fulfill that obligation. So um, that was one of many, many things that we talked about on Monday. And my sense is that Bill and Ken have already, Bill and Ken Russell may have already talked about this a little bit. Yeah, um, so I, I think so I just wanted Whatever to bring conversation we had may have been over overrated. Okay. I mean, I, I did talk to Ken, and then basically what I said was, you know, sure. Um, well, number one, we have a we have a, uh, right across the alleyway the police right. are open twenty four seven. And that was also mentioned. And so that's available, and maybe we could publicize that. Number two, our we don't have any. Obviously, it's not our. It's the public's bathrooms. We don't have an objection per se, other than security and. We would need, you know, these double doors we have are fine, but they're not really high security locked doors. So we would have to figure out a way to, you know, block off the rest of the building. I'm more, you know, security for employees coming in. If there's people sleeping in here, those kinds of things. Should there be video cameras? Should there be, we have some cameras in the building. Should there be some specifically there? The Justice Center offices are right in that area. So we'd want to think about that, you know. So it's, it's there are some obstacles is what, and so that was the conversation I had with Ken. It wasn't, you know, we can do it or we can't do it. It's that I personally wouldn't support it, which doesn't mean anything if you all do, but that for me, it would be all about the security of the folks that work here and, or, and visit here. So, and, and, and also we have, you know, expensive equipment in here that we wouldn't want stolen or damaged or anything like that. I'm just speaking for myself, there's a perfectly good bathroom across the street I know that's not going to be appealing to everyone because it's in a police station, but that's what we have, and I cannot justify spending a lot of money or resources to open this space if there is a bathroom that is already available 24-7. I will uh, take that back to the, the task force, um, and I think we're going to try to do better at teeing things up a little bit more. Uh, normally for, for agenda items um, and with as much specificity as we can. We're also, uh, we are working on the, the long-term uh, presentation of, of the, the perhaps lower priority but, but broader longer-term goals that, that the task force would like to move on. Um, Sorry, I, I do think we could do a better job of making people aware that that bathroom is available 24-7. Anyway, sorry, please yeah. continue. Yes, I agree with that. Um, and I think that's it for me, except that I'll be at Baguito's tomorrow morning at 8.30. A little sleepy. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack or Lauren? I think I've talked enough tonight already, <laughs> so I'll pass. Thank you for all your yes. work. Yes. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. <laughs> <Literally>. <laughs> Lauren. Um, I can be really brief to um, just sharing that the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee has been um, speaking with a number of uh, people who professionally 
work with cities and nonprofits and other entities of how you kind of roll out and implement um, the kind of vision that we gave this broad and laudable charge to the group and then as they've been kind of figuring out how do we kind of operationalize that and what's the scope and where do we start with these big issues um, so there's a lot of ideas that that has sparked um, and I know they're talking about um, you know what would the next steps of that be um, is there some kind of contract with someone to help us is there is this something we can do in-house so just stay tuned for um, what what they what that group uh, comes out with, um, but just wanted you to know that those conversations are happening. And um, if anyone wants to engage in that or learn more, um, let me know. I'm happy to share um, some of the kind of summaries of the conversations with the with people who do this for a living um, and some good advice we've gotten of, of kind of where we go from here to make that uh, a really productive uh, committee. Uh, so. Uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge that last week um, the, in this room we had a regional transportation um, meeting and it was very well attended and I uh, was very grateful to all the folks who organized that and all the organizations that came out to uh, talk about their work. Um, uh, really interesting, good good conversation that, that happened, so that was great. Uh, and just want to point out that the um, Taylor Street uh, opening is going to be uh, on October 25th, um, I believe. Um, the sort of d uh, talking, <laughs> the, the ceremony or whatever, will be at four o'clock uh, on the 25th. Um, so um, there may be some tours and such happening uh, after that. Um, and originally we had, I just want to acknowledge, we originally had um, scheduled that for today, but it is Yom Kippur, so. Um, grateful um, to everyone who helped shift the day and also apologize um, that um, we had um, uh, scheduled that. And also I acknowledge that we're having this meeting on Yom Kippur and, and just acknowledge that um, that's uh, uh, problematic for uh, a lot of folks. Um, so just wanted to um, point that out, apologize for that. Um, and then um, uh, Looking at, uh, I, I know um, Gary, uh, Terry, Gary? Gary, right, Terry's his wife, his wife, right, okay. Gary Holloway um, was mentioning earlier that uh, there's a, an opening for the uh, uh, shared use path, uh, Sibuinabi, I think I said it right? I'll say it a lot, because we need to hear yeah. it. Yeah. There, there was a, a different uh, emphasis Sibuinebi yeah, was yeah, was someone said earlier. I, I thought it was Sibuinebi. Hopefully, we'll have that clear um, by November eighth because that is when the <laughs> opening is three fifteen um, at Bar Hill. So uh, anyway, that's that's going to be very exciting, um, and that is it for me. Um, thank you. Oh, I just wanted to mention. Uh, I think I mentioned this before that I won't be at the next meeting. I'm going to be away from the 29th and be back on the 11th cloistered off in my monastery there. Okay. Yeah. Right. Oh, and sorry there weren't any minutes to approve this time for last meeting. I was going to finish them up last week and I got very, very sick. So I just have a couple of minor things. Uh, interesting that you mentioned DM removal. Um, one of the items on our goals list this year was, you know, to begin work on a river master plan. So uh, in that light, I met with Vermont River Conservancy folks uh, yesterday. <laughs> Busy week. Yes, yesterday. And we're going to be getting a proposal from them to, to do a river plan and outline. And some of it would be to assess what would take for, actually, we have three dams in our river corridor yeah. to, to take, you know, is it possible what it would take, how, you know, what, what kind of hydraulic studies would it take, all those, uh, all those things. So um, we should learn more. You know, you talk to them about our budget restrictions, but they, you know, the idea is that we would get some sense of what um, what this might take for our budget process. So that is underway. It's exciting, and and, and along with that is, um, I think they're going to start working with Bar Hill or Caledonia Spirits on the river access there, um, looking for grants and figuring out what it's technically the city's easement, but. Having people that actually know what they're doing would be a good idea. <laughs> so there was that. Uh, I, I attended the 
CVRPs, the regional planning meeting last night of the, the board of directors, our newest rep, Marcella Dent, was there. Uh, and they had invited me to come to talk about sort of development in Montpelier and our, where, you know, what our thoughts were. So I outlined the strategic plan and some of the elements and talked about TIF and um, some of the, the projects underway, the public projects, the bike path, the shared use paths and all those things, and as well as, you know, the potential hotel and other. So it went really well. They seemed to react to it. And um, it has been a delight having Cameron here on Monday. I think at least three of you have met her, know that she really does exist. <laughs> um, but she was really hurting by today, and so I, uh, I did insist that she not spend it with us. So. <laughs> I, I meant to mention she was uh, also at the Homelessness Task Force meeting. and On her first great, day. On her first day, and was a great presence there. So <laughs> I'm really pleased that she's here. Yeah. yeah. OK. Uh, great. So I think that. Uh, it's all of our business, so um, without objection, I'm going to consider the meeting adjourned. <laughs>